Madam Chair, members of the board, it is good afternoon. Two, good afternoon. It is two o'clock p.m. and today's Tuesday, October twentieth. My name is Brian Zelmalt. I'm the director of the county's also Office of Technology and Innovation. I'll be playing the role of technology moderator for today's virtual meeting. On the panel with me is Don Kroll from the county attorney's office, who will be serving as process moderator. Uh, before we start the meeting, let's do a quick roll call. Make sure we've got communications, and then we will get started. And we'll start as usual with Commissioner Eggers. I'm here this afternoon. Hi, Brian. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Seal, I don't see yet today. Is she? She may have not logged on yet. So we'll skip her and go to Commissioner Welch. Brian, how are you doing? And very well, sir. Thank you very much. Commissioner Long. I'm here. Good, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Commissioner Justice. Good afternoon, Brian. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Peters, I think, is not with us this afternoon. And Madam Chair. I am here, Brian. All right. And Madam yeah. Chair, if I, if I could add, I know the Commissioner yeah, Seal uh, remains at the canvassing board meeting, which is oh, ongoing. That's right. right now. And she did uh, indicate to me she planned to log in later on in the meeting, but when I left there, they were still actively canvassing. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Peters had an emergency and she can't be here. Okay. Um, is our, uh, we have a special presentation today. Uh, is the presentation person here? Presentation person has just been promoted to the panel, Madam Chair. Oh, excellent. Okay. I can't see him, of course. All right. Well, we wanted to pay tribute to Bob Dillinger, who's retiring uh, very soon. This will be his very last uh, county commission meeting. Um, and I'm sure we'll all have wonderful things to say, but I'm first going to read a proclamation. So... Uh, whereas, in recognition and in honor of the Bob Dillinger Public Defender for the Sixth Judicial Circuit, who started his career with the Pinellas County Public Defender's Office in 1976 as an assistant public defender, and whereas Public Defender Dillinger ran for his current office and was elected in November of 1996 and re-elected in 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, and 2016. And whereas public defender Dillinger was sworn in January of 1997 and defined his role of public defender as we are the hope, the hope of the innocent, the hope of our children, the hope of the poor, the hope of the mentally ill, the hope of those, those in our society seeks to execute and the hope of the otherwise marginalized members of our society. And whereas Public Defender Dillinger's vision and pursuit of the ideals of We Are the Hope established groundbreaking programs, such as the First Mental Health Unit and the Pinellas County Public Defender's Office and the Public Defender's Jail Diversion Programs. And whereas in Public Defender Dillinger's advocacy for the homeless and our veterans, he established the Pinellas County Public Defender's Homeless and Veterans Outreach Programs and partnered with other con constitutional officers to help open Pinellas Safe Harbor for the homeless involved in the criminal justice system. And whereas in Public Defender Dillinger's relentless commitment to children's health and welfare, he, he created the Juvenile Crossover Program for youth involved in the criminal justice system and family court courts, which mentored them to adulthood by partnering with several community agencies. And whereas Public Defender Public Defender Dillinger helped shape lasting legislation as the legislative chair of the P Florida Public Defenders Association from 1999 to 2018. And whereas Public Defender Dillinger championed the rights and welfare of hundreds of its employees and mentored, counseled, and inspired countless attorneys to dedicate their careers to public service. And whereas we honor Public Defender Bob Dillinger for his over 44 years of dedication and distinguished service to the law and his tireless and selfless role as a public servant. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that October 20th, 2020 be recognized as Public Defender Bob Dillinger Day. Yay. And, and Bob, Mr. Bob is online. What? 
he is a he is with us. He hasn't shared his video or his audio oh, yet. Okay. So if he wants to unmute and say a few words, he yeah, is he's available. He's probably crying back there, you know. <laughs> um, well, that's quite the surprise. I uh, I had no idea, uh, and I am close to tears actually. Uh, I certainly appreciate it. I am felt very honored to be able to serve this community uh, the way I have been. I certainly appreciate all the support the county commission has given this office, and uh, thank you very much. I'm I'm very humbled. Thank you. Well, no, thank you for your 44 years. And, you know, I just wanted to say that we have been very lucky to have you as our public defender. The people of Pinellas County have been very lucky. Um, I've always told you you were the best, you were the best social worker I ever met. Um, and you've really uh, defined for me what a public defender is supposed to be. Um, and I'm sure that's true for a lot of us. And those are big shoes somebody's going to fill. But um, hopefully you've mentored somebody well and that you'll enjoy your retirement. So thank you again. Uh, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to echo those comments. And, and Bob, I wish we had you on camera. But um, just want to echo those comments. You've been such a leader um, in our community. And there he is. Good to see you, sir. Um, and as you well know, other jurisdictions around the state and the county kind of look at Pinellas and see the way that the public defender and the courts and the um, state attorney and, and law enforcement work together in Pinellas County. And a lot of that is because of your leadership. And um, I just wanted to thank you for your work, not only in the areas that the chair talked about, but also technology on CGIS that was a, a long haul and a long process. And um, you really showed a lot of leadership there. And on JWB as well, I, I wanted to thank you for your years of work um, on JWB, especially with uh, youth uh, aging out of care. You've just really done some tremendous work and I uh, wanna wish you all the best. Thank you, I appreciate it, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Well, just uh, again, echoing the comments that uh, the chair said and, and, and Commissioner Welch just spoke. Um, uh, Bob, I, I just think of you and not only as a leader um, among, among many of us, but you are just an amazing human being and just a really good man at your heart. You bring that to the table every day, the passion for what you're doing, and you clearly have when you start talking about sieges and you start talking about IT and all that BTS and, you know, you bring the, the mind to the, to the job too, but you bring all of you every single day. And it really make, made a big difference in our community. And just thank you on behalf of many folks out there that, that perhaps felt disenfranchised from time to time and your leadership was, was rock solid. So thank you so much and best, best wishes in the next phase of your life. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Long. Yes. Um, Bob, I don't want to repeat what everyone has already said, but I especially appreciated the way in which you used to come and visit me when I was in Tallahassee and how passionate you were about trying to take care of our children and our young teens. Uh, I don't know who's going to step into your shoes, but they are mighty big shoes to fill. So I wish you Godspeed and a great, fun, exciting new chapter as you begin your, I guess, retirement, though it's hard to believe that you won't be coming back to share with us when you think we're going off the reservation. So <laughs> thank you very, very much for all that you've tried to teach us about what being a really good public defender means in our county. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. And again, it was an honor to serve you all and I look forward to staying in touch. Well, good. Like Commissioner Long said, come and tell us when we're not doing it right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Or just shoot an email like everybody else does. Okay, next on the agenda, we have citizens to be heard. What do we have, Brian? 
And I will say while you're looking. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you'd like to address something on the consent agenda or something that is not on the agenda today, this is your turn to speak. Um, if there is something on the agenda that you want to speak to, please wait till that item comes up. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on anything on the agenda, I'm sorry, on the uh, citizen to be heard portion of the agenda, uh, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. And Madam Chair, it appears we have about 16 people that wish to speak. Um, did you want, what was your time time limit that you wanted to go uh, with? Three minutes is fine. Okay. All right, so we'll start with the first uh, public comment. This is Vicki Love. Uh, Vicki, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Okay, we all received good news this morning that Pulte Homes has backed out of their purchase and planned development of the Gladys Douglas property and that the estate is given the county and the city of Dunedin three months to work out a deal that allows us to keep this property in our hands and undeveloped. Great news, and now we have to band together again to make it happen. 90 days will go fast, so I'm asking that we please add it to upcoming agendas so we can keep it moving. So just to recap, this property is 44 acres of undeveloped land. It contains the rare and endemic rosemary scrub habitat, which has been decimated across Florida, and it's the last of its kind in Pinellas County. This habitat supports many animals, including protected species. It abuts land managed by swift mud that includes Jerry Lake. Put together, this gives us almost 100 contiguous acres of land. Because of its size and the fact that it's situated in the middle of developed areas covered with asphalt and buildings, it helps with groundwater recharging, water filtration, and air quality. It also increases our storm resiliency by relieving pressure on our stormwater pumping systems and absorbing wind and storm energy that could otherwise damage surrounding developed areas. So it's more than a conservation effort. It's looking forward to how we manage and maintain the most densely populated county in the state. Because of all this, the land is eligible for grants, including a matching grant from Florida Forever, as well as others. You all have a huge coalition of support to draw on. Sierra Club, Nature Conservancy, National Geographic, Blue Green Connections, Dr. Sylvia Earle, just to name a few, are in support and ready to help. With a team like that, there's no doubt that the grants will come through. I understand that the city of Dunedin is devoting $2 million from its planned parking garage to the purchase of this property. The county has $15 million budgeted for land conservation. With the grants and the city of Dunedin funding, this puts the price well within reason for the county. And not only that, when you factor in the surrounding undeveloped property and what this 100 acres gives us both as green space to enjoy or an ecotourism opportunity, as well as the storm resiliency and relief on already taxed stormwater and other systems, it's a great deal. So to recap, we have 90 days to find a way to fund the purchase of this precious future piece of property. Please put it on upcoming agendas so that time doesn't get away from us. This property is too unique from a nature perspective and too important from a weather and infrastructure load mitigation perspective to let it slip through our fingers. Be innovative, form partnerships with the many who are already on, on board and at the ready and make it happen. Thank you. Ms. Love, for the, for the record, would you provide your address, uh, please, as well? Yes, it's 1185 Nelson Street, Dunedin, Florida. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next, by the way, we have 23 remaining speakers on Citizens to be Heard. Um, okay. our, next, our next speaker is Deborah Matthews. Uh, Ms. Matthews, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello, my name is Deborah Matthews. I live at 646 Scotland Street in Dunedin. I too am calling in about the Douglas Hackworth property. My family has been in Dunedin for over a century. My grandchildren are the sixth generation to live here. As you can imagine, many changes have happened. And to the point, like that was said before, we are the most densely packed county in the state of Florida. The Douglas Hackworth property is a gem that does not have the luxury of time. 
if we lose it, we can't get it back. I would love to walk my grandchildren through property that's not covered in sod. I would like them to see the Pinellas County that I remember that my grandmother and my great grandmother remember walking through. I want them to see the gopher tortoise, tortoises. I want them to see the pristine scrub oaks that you don't get to see when you live in the kind of urban setting that most of the county is. So I too am asking for you to put it on the agenda. Please do it in a timely manner so that we can meet the 90 day deadline. I also wanna add that I am thankful to all the commissioners for their stand and their votes on the mask ordinances. It has allowed me and my family to safely do the have tos of life, like go to the grocery store, go to gas stations, go to doctor's appointments and shop for only necessities. And you've made that possible by everyone wearing a mask, it keeps us safe. Well, I hope that you continue to follow science in your future votes. Winter is coming, thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Bailey Cunningham. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cunningham, I'm not sure if Bailey is male or female. Uh, we'll go ahead and unmute you. If you can give us your uh, first and last name, spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, my name is actually Rebecca Cunningham. Bailey is my daughter who was using it for a Zoom call earlier because that's what life is. So it's Rebecca Cunningham, R-E-B-E-C-C-A, C-U-N-N-I-N-G-H-A-M. And I'm at 523 Landfield in Safety Harbor, Florida. Thank you. And I am here today to ask you to accept the proposal to purchase the Gladys Douglas Hackworth property. This property is the last of its kind in our area, and it's paramount that as our elected leaders, you understand the importance of preserving this property for our residents as well as future generations. You cannot allow this ecological area to be decimated and destroyed to make way for yet another housing development in an already overcrowded county. The fact that Pinellas County is the most densely populated county in our state should serve as a warning sign of how imperative it is to fight to keep any remaining green spaces for the safety of our people and for our land. The lack of any recent purchases for preservation in this county highlights the importance that we absolutely must place on increasing our efforts to preserve and maintain green spaces within our county. We do live in paradise here and I take great, great pride and pleasure in the phrase, we live where you vacation. In fact, I include this on my family's Christmas card photo every year as each photo is taken from one of our many beautiful beaches or parks in the area. However, in only this past decade, I've watched as our county has literally paved over paradise. The beautiful oak trees that used to line the downtown streets of Safety Harbor were destroyed for condos. The farm where I once took horseback riding lessons in Largo is now a hotel. And time and again, I've watched as profit defeats preservation. Profit is placed before the needs of our residents. Profit is given priority over everything that should take precedence over profit. So please keep this land for preservation. This will be a legacy for generations. Thank you. Madam Chair, next speaker comes in on the phone line. I don't even have a last four digits, so I'm gonna go ahead and unmute. And if you can give us your first last name, spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello? Yes, yes. This yes, is sir. Greg Pound, Greg Pound of Largo, Florida. I just want to say something about the last caller. Our, our county has been sold out for money to our county commissioners, allowing all this building to be out of control. It's a money deal is what it is. Now we are at a time of elections and, you, and the people listening to this, we need to get the people we have in office out of office. When my daughter was taken by DCF over a dog bite and false charges brought, to, brought against us by Megan Gallagher on the Sheriff's Department, we had a law professor, B.B. Bent, with Kathy Coy from the Juvenile Justice Board go to Robert Guattari when he was the attorney for Jim Coates. And Robert Guattari refused to do anything about the situation, even though the evidence was placed before him. And you brought this county now under the judgment of allowing child molesters. Um, this, this guy that um, Jim Palermo, who was molesting my daughter at 10 years old, nothing's happened to him. And the, and the sheriff's department's taking a report on it, taking re and th they've done nothing. Are the 10 year old girl and the county commissioners have done nothing. We're in a county filled with people who have sold this nation out. Uh, politicians have become corrupt and they have sold us out. 
And the Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and the nation that forgets God. This is not paradise anymore. This is what we call a tropical illusion. This is an illusion of, of paradise. When you have the corruption, not only in Pinellas County, I'm speaking straight across America because of the love of money, the greed. Like the Bible says, the love of money is the root of all evil. And when we have this corruption going on and continuing to go for the love of money and nothing's being done. Our politicians, everyone that's sitting on the county commission board have been there for I don't know how long and they just rotate. As I said before, at other county commission meetings, Fauci said that the masks are doing nothing. The Surgeon General of the United States, you can go watch your news reports. They said they cannot protect you from the virus. The virus will go right through the, the, um, the mask. We're not being protected from no virus by the little mask we wear. It's a joke. And so what happens is these guys are keeping this down so we, can, so we can't have any meetings. We can't come together. We'll have more people die of the flu this year than of the coronavirus. And this whole thing is a big scam. And look at our government. Look at what's happened to this country, folks. You people sitting there in positions of leadership. We've got illegals running our county. We got to get Guattari out of office. This guy is Jim Coates' lawyer for nine years. He doesn't care about the people. This whole thing has been a, a has been a money maker for people who are power hungry and out of control. That's why James Madison put the separation of power in our constitution. We can't have lawyers running Tallahassee, making our laws, legislating for us. We can't have lawyers being our sheriff. Mr. Powell, your time has us. expired, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Aurora Queel. Uh, Aurora, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Yes, good afternoon. Aurora Kiel, A-U-R-O-R-A-Q-U-I-E-L. I live in 1500 Highland Ave in Largo. Thank you. Um, commissioners, I am here to plead with you to purchase the Gladys Douglas Hackworth property. I think I speak for a lot of my fellow Pinellas community members when the news we heard this morning about Pulte pulling out of this contract gave us all a lot of hope and it really overjoyed us. They did what was right. And this is further testament that companies, people, government officials alike, any stakeholder really can do the right thing. We can unite and work together for a common good. On change.org, we've gathered almost 10,000 signatures via the Sierra Club, further instilling support for preservation in our awesome county panelists. We have peacefully assembled. We are active and vocal on social and we attend your meetings and we listen. We are engaged and we, your resident taxpayers, ask that you act on the purchase of this land quickly. When you think at a greater scale and with some basic simple math, one tree equals oxygen for two people. So imagine what 44 acres of trees and unique native plants will do for our oxygen and our air quality. Commissioners, in your long-term strategies, you honor environmental stewardship. Please demonstrate the strategic and crucial value that you have promised your residents. We do trust you. We again ask that you do not give up. Between grants, environmental organizations, state funds, and engagement of your community, this can be done. And together we can save this land. Please know we respect and thank your service and our opportunity to speak. I look forward to a day where thanks to our coalition and to you that we can visit this land and see it full of life as it was meant to exist. Um, and then also a side note, I, I listened to last week's meeting and there was a commissioner who expressed kind of how misunderstood your jobs can be were undervalued. And I want you to know that a lot of us respect and value your service. Uh, please help our community with this preservation er, um, effort and leave a legacy to our children and yours. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Michelle Birnbaum. Uh, Ms. Birnbaum, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you have three minutes to address the board. Hi, my name is Michelle Birnbaum. That's B-I-R-N-B-A-U-M. I reside at 330 Promenade Drive in Dunedin. Um, I thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, those of us that support the preservation of the Douglas property here at the border of Dunedin and Clearwater did receive some hopeful news today uh, with the developer Pulte withdrawing um, their contract to purchase property to develop it. Um, we also received some great news from the city of Dunedin. They demonstrated their support for the preservation of the Douglas property with a funding proposal. I would like to start 
by thanking the city of Dunedin, its mayor, commissioners, and commissions for their unwavering support for the preservation of the Douglas property. Their support reflects a broad level of support in this community. They heard our voices and acted. Now I'm asking you to hear our voices and to act. I'm asking you to act by placing this matter on your agenda and supporting the funding proposal put forth by the city of Dunedin. It seems logical that the county commissioners would all support something that has such a broad community support, but it hasn't been the case. Some commissioners have brushed off proponents of preservation with the land is of low value and we don't have the money. These responses, frankly, are insulting and condescending. It is the very last piece of rosemary scrub in the county and how that could be considered of low value makes me wonder if it's time for us to change how we value property in this county. Um, the other issue brought up was funding. And I find it kind of difficult that members of the county board wouldn't understand that we weren't asking the county to foot the entire bill. That funding the purchase of a piece of property for preservation can and often does involve contributions from local municipalities, state, federal, and other resources, including charitable uh, trusts and funding sources, as well as private individuals. Yes, it's complex and has a lot of moving parts, but if there's a will to do it, the funding can be found. I'd also like to say that um, our local organization would like to also begin some fundraising to help and work with the county to preserve this precious piece of property. I, like a lot of the residents involved in this, never thought we would become preservation activists. It's but here fun. Are. I'm sorry, your time has expired. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for listening. And I would like to be able to thank you guys too soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, for the record, we have 21 remaining speakers. Our next speaker is Jamie Manfra. Jamie, if you can go ahead and unmute and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello, thank you. This is Jamie Manfra, J-A-I-M-E, Manfra, M-A-N-F-R-A. And um, we have a small school by the Douglas Hackworth property and our school's address is 1950 Virginia Street, Clearwater, Florida. 33763. Thank you. And thank you too. We have called in today um, to also uh, request that you keep um, this matter on your agenda and um, consider putting the funds together necessary to preserve the property. Um, we wanted to thank the local government for listening to all of the, um, the action and the protesting and the awareness that the community and also the students have put together. Um, it really helps us strengthen their sense of environmental stewardship. Um, we really think um, that this is an amazing way to empower and to show students and young people um, and to strengthen their sense of belonging to a community at a time when their world and their future is so uncertain. Um, the fact that the developers pulled out has been so empowering for the students and the families who have been so involved in this, in writing emails and also in protesting. Um, we'd really also, uh, like to say that it's an amazing opportunity to really transcend political and superficial biases, um, where we can see community work together based on mutual interest in social action. Um, it's a unifying factor if we can keep it at the forefront of the agenda. And lastly, we wanted to say that, um, that we are here standing by, all of our students, our middle schoolers, our high schools and their family to assist in any way possible and to use the power of youth to preserve the pattern in a way of life in our community um, so again, we just really ask that you keep this on your agenda and we'll be looking for ways to assist in any fundraising and support of the Sierra Club and also connecting with local community. So thank you for strengthening our students' belief that, um, that people matter and that we can really trust in our local government. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Dylan Hubbard. Uh, Dylan, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Uh, yes, thank you. Again, my name is Captain Dylan Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina, 
And I'm speaking today on behalf of 40 plus businesses from inside Johns Pass Village, the number one tourist destination in Pinellas County. Our business address is 170 Johns Pass Boardwalk, Madeira Beach, Florida. I know Commissioner Long is presenting uh, an issue later on in other business and uh, the county commissioners have received a memo from Commissioner Long's office on this issue. We have a terrible safety concern just festering inside Johns Pass where we, uh, to quote the city of Madeira Beach's fire chief, we are on borrowed time before something serious happens. We have high currents because of the sand buildup and right now, Unfortunately, the Army Corps of Engineers is telling the city of Madeira Beach that it falls to the county as the non-federal sponsor of the 2018 Inlet Management Plan to take action. And we need help. We have a meeting coming up, but unfortunately it is a long way away after the election and we have immediate concerns and serious grave safety issues, drainage issues, access issues, and Johns Pass Village is filling up. It's now a third of the way blocked with sand and it continues to further restrict the tidal flows. The manatees are about to start exiting Johns Pass to head north for the winter and the springs and they're gonna be forced into the middle of the channel to cause more boat interactions with our local manatee population. There's huge economic concerns from the residents over property taxes and property values as Johns Pass Village really, really diminishes. If businesses start to leave the pass, we're gonna see a huge trickle, trickle down economic effect. And the 2018 Inlet Management Plan Alternative 6 needs to be further explored and the economic benefit needs to be further explored in lengthening those jetties by 230 feet. It's already laid out for the county. We just need your support as a non-federal sponsor. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Madam Chair, for the record, we have 18 remaining speakers. Our next speaker is Virginia. I don't have a last name. So Virginia, if you'll unmute and give us your first last name, spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Virginia Frizzle, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 14956 Crown Drive, Largo, Florida, 33774. It's pouring here. Um, I'm going to Second, that um, John's pass as a voter uh, right away. I hope that gets taken care of. Don't flip anybody out of their boats. Um, I hope you listen to him. The caller before said something about a meeting last week. No, we were shut up last week. Um, have not given us the right to speak. I'm calling upon the order section 286.0114 of the Florida statute. The division hereby establishes a public, co public comment policy applicable to all committee council and work groups. Public comments about, and I'm just gonna brief, public comment, comments about items listed on the agenda will occur just prior to the group's discussion of action. The agenda, a citizen may speak no longer than three minutes. The division allocates up to 30 minutes as a public comment period at the end of each meeting for citizens who wish to appear before the group to make a request voice a complaint or concern, express an opinion or other item of recognition, the chair meeting leader will divide the time um, equally. Um, paraphrase, public comments on items not listed on the agenda will occur at the end of the meeting during public comment period, as in a number two. When a group considers matters during a public meeting upon which it will take action, no action shall be taken until the chair meeting leader requests and receives comments from the public. This is being, uh, the um, state emergency local is being expired, um, not until the um, end of the week on the 23rd. There's no meeting scheduled next week. Um, the other next one is expiring the 30th. At this point, it's all fake, but um, I still think we need to stay upon it. It'd be really enjoyable to send the sheriff to each one of your homes because you're not allowing us to speak and you're breaking the law. So why don't you end this next week? We don't get to speak. I will send the sheriff to each one of your homes for breaking law 286.0114. Thank you very much for this item time to speak. At this time, I will be speaking again. Have a great day. Thank you. 
Madam Chair, our next speaker is Michelle Moore. Uh, Ms. Moore, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Michelle Moore, M-O-O-R-E. I live at 301 36 Avenue Northeast, St. Pete. Um, uh, I just wanted to first say thank you. You guys have been awesome during all of this. Also go Rays. Um, I was mainly calling in today because I would still very much like the mask mandate to continue. I think it's important for our community to stay strong during all this. Our economy can stay strong if we can just keep this going. It's the smallest, littlest thing that we could do to just make sure that we keep our community safe. Um, I also think it's respectful to do this for our doctors who are working hard, our teachers who are working hard, our first responders who are working so hard. Um, and um, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to say thank you again. I really appreciate all that you guys are doing and I hope we can continue um, being uh, successful during this pandemic with our low rates. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have 16 remaining speakers. Our next speaker is Kelsey. I don't have a last name. So Kelsey, if you go ahead and unmute and give us your first last name, spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to speak. My name is Kelsey. Kyle Fuchs, K-E-L-S-E-Y, K-E-I-L hyphen F-U-C-H-S. I'm at 2012 Yale Avenue in Dunedin. Um, this is my first time having the opportunity um, to speak. So again, I truly appreciate my voice being heard. And I am here to speak about the Douglas Halfworth property um, and its extreme importance in preservation. Uh, I am standing by, uh, in addition to my fellow neighbors, um, to put in the efforts to preserve this property, um, to spread the word, to help raise funds, um, whatever, whatever we can do as residents of Pinellas County um, to help, I'm standing by. Uh, we've come this far uh, for Pulte to pull out. Um, so with all the support of the residents who agree that this property is of extreme importance to preserve, uh, we are standing by to keep pushing through until, until it happens. And that is all short and sweet. Thank you very much again. Um, Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Shannon. I don't have a last name. So Shannon, if you'll unmute and give us your first last name, spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. And Shannon, you'll have to unmute on your side, please. Bottom left corner. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm Shannon Brooks. I'm in Clearwater, Florida, and I would just let you like to let you know these mask orders are affecting people who need to go to the doctors. I try to make a doctor's appointment so that way I could get a, a slip so I don't have to wear a mask when I go to college. And she told me, well, you have to have a mask on. And so now I'm really frustrated because I actually have to go to the doctor and I can't because of this mask order. So I just like to let you know, these are affecting people. I am not saying this, is, this shouldn't be political. Honest to God, this really should not be political. This is just common decency. We need to do something about these mask orders affecting everyday life. And I would just want to thank you all for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Beth. I don't have a last name. So Beth, if you'll unmute and give us your first last name, spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Uh, my name is Beth Hovind, H-O-V-I-N-D. And I live at 1996 Whispering Way in Tarpon Springs, Florida. Thank you. I want to thank the Pinellas County Commission for all of your work in preserving green spaces throughout the county. We have some beautiful parks, beautiful green areas, but we're not done yet. And as you are aware, there are four parcels, large parcels, 
currently under contract for development. We'll make that three because Douglas is no longer under contract, but is still very imminent. The environmental communities of the county are uniting to assist you in finding ways to preserve all of them. We understand budgets and we also understand grants and we'll work with you to find ways to preserve these important spaces. The Douglas parcel is imminent and we offer our assistance in finding practical and effective alternatives to development. We encourage your excitement in preserving our green space. Once developed, it is lost forever to future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, for the record, we have 13 remaining uh, people that wish to speak. Our next speaker is Kai Rubach. Uh, Kai, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. So my name is Kai Rubach. I live at 1512 Albemarle Court in Dunedin, Florida. And Kai, I'm, I'm sorry, would you be willing to come a little bit closer to your microphone? Not really, sir. Uh, if I shout, uh, that, does it, yeah, that, okay. that, that's better. That's good. Okay, I'll just shout then. All right. So uh, I'm, I'll make it brief then. Uh, I'm calling in to show support for the Douglas Hackworth property um, on behalf of the 9,500 petition signatures and the uh, thousands and thousands of other residents of Dunedin and surrounding communities that appreciate the work of the Dunedin City Council and would urge the uh, Pinellas Commission to um, put this issue on your agenda uh, and address it at your earliest opportunity. Uh, and thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker comes to, it, comes to us on the phone line, last four digits 7125. If you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your first last name, spelling, and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. In 7125, oh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. All right, go ahead. Hi, my name is Teresa Rubalcava, T-H-E-R-E-S-A, Rubalcava, R-U-B-A-L, C A V as in Victor A. And Teresa, real quick, live, can you can you turn the broadcast down uh, on your computer or behind you? Sure. Thank you. Still there? Yes, ma'am. That's much better. Thank you. Okay, I live at uh, three nineteen LeBeau Street in Clearwater and I've been here for 30 years and I grew up in Clearwater also. Um, I never imagined the whole area would become developed as it is, but it is. And I think it's very important that we save the Douglas Hackworth property along with the tides and other properties that are green space. We don't need any more homes or condos, the particular land there at, the Douglas Hackworth property, it's a real treasure. It's unspoiled. It's very rare in the fact that it's never been built on. It's never been a pasture. It's never been a road. Certain areas of it have been that way for thousands of years. And if we tear it up, we can never, ever fix it. We can never, ever get it back. So I think it's important that we keep that and preserve that for future generations. Please help to turn this property into a treasured park please take this consideration when it comes into consideration when it comes to the green spaces we have left. They need to remain green. Our county is full. We don't want or need any new developments. The quality of life for the people that already live here should take precedence over a developer's profits. Please, let's come together and create this new park, something truly positive in this tumultuous year that we've had to survive. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. And please keep the masks. Thank Have you. a good day. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Lita. I do not have a last name. So Lita, if you'll go ahead and unmute and give us your first last name, spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. My name is uh, Lita. Also, uh, that's what everybody knows me as. My real name is Bridget, B-R-I-D-G-E-T, Ben Dune. B-E-N-D-U-H-N. I reside at 552 Chicago Avenue here in Dunedin. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you everyone for letting us speak. 
uh, congratulations on the retirement out there. I'm sure that's going to rock for you. I'm calling for the Douglas Hackworth property. Um, I, I don't have a speech for you other than we have really been actively protesting this since I, it, it's been, seems like months now. Um, there's been a lot of people to put their heart and soul to this. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's common. We don't need any more people. We have enough money here. We're too populated as it is. And we honestly don't really even need any more parks and stuff for people to trample on. There's a lot of wildlife that lives on this property, including coyotes that have absolutely nowhere to go. And uh, it's just pretty much going to be roadkill. Uh, I fear that that will also get tampered with if anything is done with it. But if that has to take place over development, then I am all on board for that. Um, I've stood for this since day one. I will keep standing. And um, we hope that we do have your support in this. We, I know all of us have talked to multiple sources of ways of gaining financing and assistance to whatever is left um, that we can't pull in. So we are all on board with the assistance of doing that and hope that you will take this all into consideration and in making it an immediate priority as our days are limited and there's a lot of money to be raised. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have 11 speakers remaining. Our next speaker is Barbara Walker. Uh, Barbara, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello, this is Barbara Walker, B-A-R-B-A-R-A-W-A-L-K-E-R, -A -A -E and I reside at 3019 Bradford Circle in Palm Harbor. Um, thank you so much for hearing me today. I uh, would like to concur with the rest of the callers that called um, in support of um, protecting the uh, uh, Douglas Hackworth property. I especially appreciate their sense of urgency about it and their perspective about how many people we have in the county. Um, I, I think that the climate, climate change and the loss of natural resources is about us or is at least as urgent as the pandemic. And uh, yet we don't always have an opportunity to react um, where we could really make some impact. And the, the Douglas Hackworth property is one that if we do react and save that property, it has impact. So um, I also appreciate the masks. Please keep the masks uh, going and you all are doing a really great job. And I hope you have um, a wonderful uh, rest of the week and weekend. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker comes to us on the phone line, last four digits, 2232. If you can go ahead and unmute and give us your first last name, spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. And 2232, you'll have to unmute on your side, please. Hello? Madam Chair, I'm going to try to come back to this one. I think they're having technical difficulty. Um, let me go to Dave Silman, who's our next speaker. Mr. Silman, if you can unmute and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. I think you can hear me okay? Yes, sir. Dave Silman, S-I-L-L-M-A-N, 1607 Stonehaven Way in Tarpon Springs. Also uh, calling about the uh, Douglas Hackworth property. Want to uh, thank you all. I know I, it's my understanding that uh, the, the support by and large uh, on the commission. We appreciate that. And um, I, I, although I do speak for myself, I'm an active member of the Sierra Club um, here in Pinellas, of which there's uh, 14,000 members at least, I believe. I'm also an active member of the League of Women Voters, which um, prioritizes land preservation and environmental issues broadly um, uh, quite highly. Um, that goes for our North Pinellas League, South Pinellas League, and the State League. So this is a broadly popular um, thing to, to help preserve a property, especially one as exquisite as this. All I would add is a little bit of the economic issue. Please don't underestimate the economic uh, value of um, preserving green space. It really does provide real services like flood and stormwater control, which I know is a big challenge throughout the county. Uh, wildlife habitat, which of course uh, gets to our tourist economy, not to mention our, our, our ways of life. Um, uh, preserving property means less property able to be developed, less supply, 
in the real estate game, puts upward pressure on property values. And I've read research um, directly pointing to the fact that preserving green space raises property values often for several blocks out to adjacent properties, which results in higher tax revenue, which oftentimes can pay the debt service on a bond issue. And I know um, by and large, the biggest challenge here is finding the money. Um, I hope you'll seriously take a look at um, doing a bond issue at today's interest rates. It's just a great time for any of us as um, governments, businesses, or individuals to be borrowing money at these rates. That's just smart business. And um, maybe it's a great way to engage the county. Maybe you could sell these as green bonds. I know we probably have a lot of customers out there amongst the groups we've, we've talked about. So um, that's all. Just want to interject that. Thank you for your service. Thank you for the mask mandate. Masks save lives, period. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Isaiah Neal. Uh, Isaiah, if you'll go ahead and unmute and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Thank you, Isaiah Neal, uh, Clearwater. Okay, thank uh, you. Appreciate your help, Ryan. You've been a great IT person. I hope they give you a raise. Um, <laughs> as a Pinellas County resident and father of four, I'm calling for an end of the local state of emergency. Um, while you guys don't set policy for the school board, um, and their abusive mask requirement of our youngest citizens, the board, the school board does take uh, their direction from your county mandate and Dr. Cho, who they're inviting to speak into their workshops and, and consult with them on, on what direction they should go. So your decision as a county and as a commission carries a lot of weight. Uh, my, my students, my children um, are still ad adversely affected by the school mask ordinance as they're unable to receive an equitable and fair education online or in person. So currently they're homeschooled and not receiving education that they should be afforded. Um, I also want to make a comment to caution against the use of any public funds to, to promote flu shots um, in, in the marketing. You guys support measures to limit the spread of COVID by masks, but then turn around and ask citizens to roll up your sleeves and inject a live virus. Um, if we have a second wave, it'll be due to flu vaccine shedding, uh, coupled with the respiratory and bacterial infections caused by the masks. And I just wanted to ask if you guys are aware of uh, according to the Health Resources and Services Administration, 37% um, of over 5,000 compensation petitions to the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program were a result of complications with or injury or death to the, by the flu vaccine. Um, and in the past year, flu shot injury compensation has increased 72% um, with that compensation program um, between 2016-2017. So, you know, the, people talk about the flu shot being healthy. I would, I would urge you guys to consult and look into that a little bit deeper. Um, but I just want to let you guys know it's time to end the county state of emergency. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Jay Hardman. Uh, Mr. Hardman, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Thank you. My name is Jay Hardman, J-A-Y-H-A-R-D-M-A-N. I live at 1513 Ocadia Drive East in Clearwater, uh, actually unincorporated county. Uh, I just wanted to add my voice to all of the eloquent and speakers with their cogent comments, and I'll keep mine brief, about the Gladys Douglas Hackworth property. Um, I'm, a, I'm a retired science educator, uh, evolutionary biologist, anthropologist, and archaeologist, and I am a native of Pinellas County, so I've seen uh, the development that's happened here. And I'm I'm really want to reinforce the idea that that rosemary scrub in our state is unique in the world, and to have it here in Pinellas County is truly unique. It's not only prehistoric; it's ancient. It was here when the first sand dunes blew up on Florida. And so I think that it's such an amazing resource that we have. And, and, I, and again, I just want to reiterate, I don't want to reiterate what others have said about its preservation and all the benefits that we could receive from keeping it. So anyway, I want to, I, I want to uh, entreat you to advance it into the agenda and so that so that people can get behind it and help to raise the funds that will preserve this precious jewel in our county. 
And also, I want to thank you for your service and for the mask mandates. And I want to reinforce that I think uh, the science should triumph over emotion and that the masks are a good thing. And I hope we keep it up. So thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Jeremy Reynolds. Uh, Mr. Reynolds, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Awesome. It's Jeremy Reynolds, J-E-R-E-M-Y-R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S. <clears throat> My address is 973 Cedarwood Avenue, Dunedin, Florida. <laughs> Thank you. In the 1950s and 60s, development in Pinellas County was at an unprecedented pace. Originally, what we know today as Honeymoon Island was supposed to be a development of over 30,000 people. The Dunedin Causeway was originally envisioned as a toll road that would connect through Caladesi to North Clearwater Beach. Now, through various political fights and activism, we have managed to strike a balance and in the process learn an invaluable lesson that our environment is our economy. It's why people live here. It's why people visit here. We learn the benefits to local governments in preserving green space in nearly built out areas is to keep the people where the resources are and to encourage education and tourism through ecology. The result of this was to increase the value of surrounding properties, ensuring tax revenues for governments and enhancing the quality of life for residents while creating jobs and enhancing a world-class experience for our visitors. Our grandchildren will greatly benefit from having the Gladys Douglas Preserve. However, this is not the end of the story. This is the beginning of a new chapter in cooperative ecology where business interest and ecological preservation exist together in a complementary relationship. As such, it is time the historical will the residents of Pinellas County be brought to bear in a new directive, a directive that seeks to secure and develop ongoing revenues to continue the balance residents and visitors desire and expect. Today, I implore you as elective leaders to take the necessary steps to dedicate a core group of professionals who will seek out and secure grant funding to complement taxpayer dollars for the preservation of ecology and restoration of our environment on an ongoing and permanent basis. For this is not the for first, nor I pray it be the last time that a preserve is needed and created for the enrichment of our community. The only resource more valuable than the people who live here <laughs> is the paradise we enjoy. Let's ensure that it remains that way for generation to come. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have 10 speakers remaining. Our next speaker is Craig Murtha. Uh, Mr. Murtha, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. My name is Craig Murtha, that's C-R-A-I-G-M-U-R-T-H-A. I live at 145 Belma Drive, West in Largo. Thank you. I just want to emphasize that this is not just a Dunedin issue. I live in Largo, and this preserve is, an, is as important to me as any preserve in Largo. And I'm not alone. I've spoken to many people throughout the county, and they are saddened and shocked about what has transpired. Everyone in our county values all of the preserves because we can all visit them within a reasonable drive of our homes. But there is clearly not enough preserves because people still feel overwhelmed by, the over, by our uh, over-urbanized environment that we live in. For example, not too long ago, a friend said to me that he just had to, to take his kids out of Pinellas County for the weekend because he could not stand the traffic, the noise, and the lack of green space. Just two days ago, another friend said almost the exact same thing. Now those two friends are professional people. They have plenty of resources. They can take their kids wherever they want. But what about the working class families that are struggling just to make ends meet? Where will they go to get away from it all? It's, it's quite possible that the children of those struggling families may never get an opportunity to visit a forest. The interesting thing here is that a lot of those children from those working class families live just north of downtown Clearwater. Think about all of the neighborhoods just north of Drew Street all the way out to Dunedin. Many of those neighborhoods are working class and they're within a 10 minute drive of the Gladys Douglas Preserve. You have an opportunity to create a place for those children in North Clearwater and beyond that will educate them, inspire them and change their lives forever. We know this is a growing, that there, excuse me, there is a growing body of evidence that children who are exposed to an abundance of green space are more intelligent, have fewer behavior problems and have lower propensity to be involved with crime. The question is, what is the value of that? The county spends $300 million a year on law enforcement. How much of that budget could be reduced if we have happier, healthier, well-adjusted children? So the question is not what the cost of, the pres of preserving this property is, but what the cost of not preserving this precious place. 
it is certain that if you do not preserve this precious place, you will always have some level of regret and sadness. By contrast, if you do preserve this property, you will be- Yes, my name's Kate Lavanche, L-A-V-A-N-C-H-E. It's Kate, K-A-T-E. I reside at 9322 141st Street in Seminole. Thank you. My first comments are as a representative of the Save Bay Point organization. We wanted to take the opportunity to first and foremost thank you, the commissioners, once again for your purchase of the neglected Bay Point property and for your strong stewardship of the property since your ownership. We thank Commissioner Long in particular for listening to our concerns and providing insights for the past five years, championing the value of this beautiful green space. We also want you to know that our experience with the county staff to date has been extraordinary. Our interactions with Kelly Levy, Paul Beltron, Blake Lyons, and many others, but especially Jennifer Shannon, with whom we have worked most co closely, have been very friendly, positive, and informative. We've been impressed by their accessibility, professionalism, and openness. In all of our communications, we have felt that they have listened, been interested in, and are committed to responding to the issues and concerns of the community. They are assets to the county and representing you well. We continue to be excited to work as a partner with you and county staff to take advantage of this opportunity to create something special for the county right in our backyard. And on a personal note, not representing anyone but myself, I feel compelled to make a couple of additional comments. Throughout my career, I have worked in with and been exposed to all levels of government. I have to say that I am most impressed with this Board of Commissioners. Given how partisan politics dominates our landscape these days, you all have seemed to rise above the fray. In the times which I have observed the commissioners, both inside and outside of commission meetings, you have always displayed a genuine respect for each other and offer a refreshing level of professionalism in doing your job. Even when you have differences, you are thoughtful, listen and respect each other's opinions and try to find common ground for an informed solution, which in most cases, most all cases, resort, results in a majority uh, of folks agreeing to it. It is inspiring to see how much you care and work together for the benefit of Pinellas County citizens. You set an example which other elected officials would do well to emulate. I hope this never changes. Thank you for your commitment to and hard work to um, the citizens of your county. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have seven speakers remaining. Our next speaker is Yvette Gaw. Uh, Ms. Goff, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, give us your spelling and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Yeah, Yvette Gaw, 9371 Blind Pass Road, St. Pete Beach. Um, I guess what I've noticed and what I've seen here is social conditioning is a true thing. Um, you guys have mentioned about having doctors. I do have a doctor that is a triple board certified doctor out of Tampa that would be more than willing to come on to our calls. Dr. Marguerite Grease Brisson, she's an MD and a PhD, has had, had to say this about masks and their effects on our brains in a recent report entitled COVID-19 Mask or a Crime Against Humanity and Child Abuse. The rebreathing of our ex exhaled air will without a doubt create oxygen deficiency and a flooding of carbon dioxide. We know that the human brain is very sensitive to oxygen, oxygen deprivation. There are nerve cells, for example, in the hippocampus that can't be longer than three minutes without oxygen. They can't, cannot survive. The acute warning symptoms are headaches, drowsiness, dizziness, issues in concentration, slowing down of the re reaction time and reactions of the cognitive system. When to say, when one of the callers said, thank you, masks are saving lives, I will challenge that individual to do his research. What saves lives are people exercising, taking their vitamins, eating healthy, and building up a strong immune system. Masks, and respectfully, I will say that I do not look to you as a board of commission to w worry about my safety. It is my job and my husband's job to worry about the safety of our family and for us to take personal responsibility for our health. The government overreach on your particular size has been, uh, it's, a, it's awful. 
and it's unconstitutional. So I will ask you to please rescind this in the emergency order and please end the mask mandate. It is a crimes against humanity. And for our children, that is our next generation. And those are the ones I'm concerned about. So if y'all can't see the overreach that is going on, I, I don't even know what to say. Additionally, if you would like those doctors, I will email you and let you know that you can speak to these doctors that are locally, including my personal double board certified doctor who does not um, who does not agree with the mask and understands how damaging they are to our bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is coming in on the phone line, last four digits, 1330. If you can unmute yourself and give us your first, last name, spelling, and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, good afternoon. David Ballard, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. A long train of usurpations, the Declaration of Independence, further states to complete perfidy and works of death, to candidly eat us out of our subsistence, to ravage, to reduce a long train of usurpations, to murder the inhabitants of this land, to merciless destroy all ages and conditions scarcely paralleled in the most barbaric of ages is what the Declaration of Independence and the liberty for which it stands is for destroying, indirectly undermining, as proscribed by George Washington in his farewell address, deliberately bankrupting the water supply in Article 1, Section 8, birthing a ship of war in time of peace from Article 1, Section 10, taking liberty, property, and life while naturalizing water jurisdictions under the 14th Amendment is the objective of this Constitution to establish absolute despots and tyrants as declared the declaration states mankind is more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable and evil first obtaining suffrages themselves then betraying the interests of mankind as set out in federalist paper number 10 candidly evinced cruelty is what the declaration of independence and it stands for now if I was Jewish, would I want to stay on this long train of candid destruction and death? Declaring to leave and emigrate, the Jews, working as mercenaries for the British, authoring, writing the Declaration of Independence, warn their British brethren not to extend their unwarranted jurisdiction over them. The Indians that are tax-free in the 14th Amendment applies to the 12 tribes of Israel, thereby naturally as deduced the gentiles remain and are left to die on that long train of usurpations a process of death a ship of war that great britain and israel set in motion over 240 years ago the holocaust is being used to give israel its cover as to what israel has declared to railroad against the gentiles intent on vanquishing the christians here in this land an evil train of usurpations, a ship of war in time of peace, an evil seen as the devil on page 80 of Maloney's Water Code, an evil rising as fact from under Article 3, Section 2 of this Constitution, and I feel as though we need to surface this issue as well, and we've got a conversation to talk about on a constitutional level. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is last four digits 7881. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your first, last name, spelling, and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Uh, yes, this is Carla Rudolph, and I live in on 25th Avenue North in St. Petersburg. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to call and say I am in total agreement with the previous caller, Yvette Gall. I don't need to repeat everything she said, but I would like you to listen to her. Everything she said, I truly believe is true, and this is science, and she has doctors who will talk to you. Um, I'm just asking you, stop the mask mandate, get rid of the emergency order, and please wake up and, and listen to, to other voices here. There is science in what we're saying. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have four speakers remaining. Our next speaker is Don Bowler. Uh, Ms. Bowler, if you'll go ahead and unmute and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Don Bowler, B as in boy, O-H-L-E-R. I live in St. Petersburg. Uh, given having already heard in anticipation of what is yet to come, according to the Citizens Guide for Pinellas County, remarks may be 
Remarks may be up to three minutes at the chairman's discretion. Speakers should make their comments concise and to the point and present any data or evidence they wish the commission to consider. All remarks should be addressed to the commission as a body and not to any one member. Speakers must be respectful of others' opinions and refrain from making personal attacks. Any person who becomes disorderly or who fails to confine remarks to the identified subject or business at hand shall be cautioned by the chairman and given the opportunity to conclude his her remarks in a decorous manner and within the designated time limits. If any person failing to comply as cautioned may be barred by the chairman from making any additional comments during the meeting unless permission to continue again to continue or again address the commission is granted by the majority of the commissioners present. If an individual is declared out of order, he, she may be requested to leave the lectern and may be subject to physical removal from the assembly room. In the case of virtual, I would think that could include being muted. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Orlando Acosta. Uh, Mr. Acosta, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your uh, spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. All right. Hi, Brian. Thanks a lot. Orlando oh. Acosta. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you. It's been a while. Uh, Orlando Acosta, 1155 53rd Avenue, North St. Pete, Florida, 33703. And it is good to see you all again. Uh, I've been working the census all summer and uh, meeting hundreds, hundreds of folks over here throughout Pinellas County. And a few weeks ago, uh, part of a select group to go help Charleston mm -hmm. get themselves across the finish line as well. And we're all very proud from throughout the Southeast area to have helped them get to the 99% point, just like we did here in Pinellas. You know, given all the divisiveness in our society and even as evident over here with the speakers coming on, uh, there are really nice folks out there, all right? We Americans are really good people. Um, and I firmly believe, and I'm not alone in that, all the other enumerators that came from other states and we converged on Charleston, we're swapping stories. And, you know, 95% of folks that we, we talked with were good folks. Um, what we're hearing over here, you know, the naysayers, the, the ones that bring up bogus science and the ones that uh, uh, make things uncomfortable for you, and I appreciate your positions, I firmly believe they're in the minority. All right? And I look at government, especially in our democracy, to protect us from the tyranny of the minority. This is an issue of freedom, the mass. Uh, we have the freedom to move. We ought to have the freedom to go to school, the freedom to work, the freedom to pray, the freedom to do all that, freedom from the threat of COVID, all right? And we know what the answer is. Uh, those that claim to have a freedom to not wear a mask wherever they want, that freedom has a limit, all right? That freedom ends where my freedom begins, all right, to live my life. And I appreciate the commission taking the uh, political risks in doing that right thing and standing firm with the science that's solid and providing us the leadership that in the long run is going to make us a stronger community, a stronger county, and a bellwether for what that should be done uh, in light of this pandemic throughout the country. Uh, Pinell Schools, I'm very proud of what they're doing. Uh, our stepson has returned because of how well they're conducting themselves when it comes to COVID. When you have a bunch of teenagers wearing masks, as I see every time I go over to Hollins to drop my kid off or to pick them up, I tell you what, teenagers can do that, adults can do it. Uh, and uh, kudos to the school board for the uh, policies and procedures they have in place, and definitely a benchmark for other districts and quite frankly, all other adult endeavor that we're involved in. All right. So uh, I'll leave it at that. And again, thank you. It's good to see you all. I uh, thank you for all your work and uh, look forward to talking with you again. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, last word, the uh, acquisition of that property, it would be awesome to have a large green space here in Pinellas. We're going to keep on growing. I grew up in New York City, Staten Island, which has the largest green space in New York City, all right, bigger than Central Park. And it made a difference in my life. I'd like to have future generations experience that as well. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have three remaining speakers that wish to be heard. Our next speaker is Bonnie Korniak. Uh, Bonnie, if you can unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Thank you. My name is Bonnie Korniak, K-O-R-N-I-A-K, 531 83rd Avenue North in St. Petersburg. I would just like to ask for your support in addressing the horrendous sand intrusion problem at Johns Pass. With one third of the paths 
already overtaken with sand, it's creating a huge safety issue for citizens, tourists, and the small business owners in Johns Pass as well. The sand is also blocking the storm sewer drainage pipes and flooding the streets in Johns Pass every time it rains, creating health and safety concerns. Extending the jetty with the plans you already have in your possession could eliminate further damage to the area. John's past businesses bring in millions of dollars to the community. Not handling this situation is putting these small businesses and the whole community at risk. It is crucial that immediate action be taken. Please help save John's pass. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is on the phone line, last four digits, 9719. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your first, last name, spelling, and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello. Uh, try unmuting again. You were just unmuted and I think you muted yourself again. Can you hear me? 9719, can you hear me? All right, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. We're going to have to go to another caller here. Uh, I'm going to try 2232 again. We were having technical difficulty last time. We'll try one more time. Uh, last four digits, 2232. If you can unmute yourself and give us your first, last name, spelling, and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. And I'm sorry, Madam Chair, we're having technical difficulty still. Um, okay. All I have left is Nicole Matthews, who I think already spoke earlier. So with that, I think uh, we don't have anybody new that wishes to comment. Um, okay. Uh, well, then let's go on to the consent agenda. Do we have anything that needs to be pulled? Yes, Commissioner Welch. Uh, just on item 20, I just have a question on it. Okay. A request. We usually, it's the uh, Housing Finance Authority report on the Housing Trust Fund and the Housing Land Trust. We normally, and I don't know if this is the right time, Barry, but we get a cumulative report that shows all the projects that were funded, uh, the funding sources and how much was leveraged. Can we get that if it's the right time for that? I'll follow up with them. Obviously, okay. I'm not aware. So we, we can certainly follow up and ask for that report. Okay. Madam Chair, item yes. five. Item five. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Item four. Okay. Anything else? I'll move the balance. Excuse me? Move the balance of the consent. Okay, thank you. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Long. Uh, all, all in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you, I guess we have five, zero. Okay, I'm glad you got your internet back, Commissioner Long, because- Thank you. We were getting I was working on it. There. Um, all right, item four. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I just thought it might be a good idea to, again, um, invite Gay Lancaster back at a future meeting to discuss the, the latest work from our Inspector General. Clearly, there's a lot of good things that have transpired over the, over the last few years. Um, there Originally, I guess 235 recommendations, 113 were implemented, 20 are considered uh, are considered an acceptable alternative, 49 have been partially implemented, 22 have not been implemented, and 31 are no longer applicable. So obviously a lot of progress has been made and maybe we could just have her back to talk a little bit more about how things are going and maybe some of those things that haven't been implemented, what the game plan is. But Clearly good work has been done. I'm glad we have it back under our control here in the county. Uh, so really don't have any other issue. I move approval on the item. Just want to see if we can bring that forward, Barry. Thank you. Second. Okay. We have a motion from Commissioner Edgar, second from Commissioner Welch. Uh, do I need to take comment? No, this is consent agenda. No, yes? Okay. <laughs> All right, all in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries five zero. Item five. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to take one moment to thank our staff for finally moving this project along with the new joint use uh, fire station and lift station over in North Reddington Beach. And I specifically wanted to 
kind of sort of brag about the five small business enterprise firms that have been included in awarding of this contract. I oh. think that certainly uh, lends the right one. What? This is not the right, that's not item five on my agenda. It was item oh, nine. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. I apologize, it was item okay. nine. Um, all right, item nine. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, but we need to pass item five then. Okay, I move that we pass item five and I'm sorry for getting that wrong. All right. Okay, okay we you. have a motion. Commissioner Long, second from Commissioner Welch. All in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries 5-0. All right, item nine. Yeah, I just wanted to finish by saying, you know, we, we talk a lot about the small business enterprise uh, folks and giving them opportunities in county government. And I think this is just a terrific opportunity to highlight the fact that we actually have done what we said we were going to do. So I just wanted to say thank you to Barry and the staff that have been working on this. We've been talking about it an awfully long time. So. Okay. Well, we don't need to pass this again since we already passed it. I we did. <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, where are we? Um, item 24, local state of emergency. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is the local state of emergency that would extend it from October the 23rd through October the 30th. Um, Dr. Cho, Dr. Jameson is on the line. Um, as you know, we continue to watch what's occurring both locally, regionally, and nationally. Um, we are we continue to implement all of the various programs um, throughout uh, that with the county through the, both the CARES Act funding supporting local um, EMS and fire personnel nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and um, others with uh, PPE as necessary. Um, and we also are a little concerned, but it's uh, too early to tell about a slight uptick that we're seeing. Uh, we're certainly seeing that nationally, but uh, it's affecting us here locally too. Um, Dr. Cho is on the line. I'd ask for him to give you um, kind of that trend data. And um, he can also talk about uh, the the pro process we're using to refine that criteria as we previously discussed. Uh, good, af good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm just gonna speak a real, uh, at first with uh, some of the trends. Uh, as Barry mentioned, we are seeing uh, we are seeing a rise in our co uh, cases in our community as well as uh, regionally. Um, our seven day rolling case count is 137. Our seven day rolling percent positivity uh, is 4.8%. Keeping in mind, just a few weeks ago, the case counts were in the 70s as, and the percent positivity was at 3%. So we have uh, seen that increase. Now, in terms of the death, uh, we're at, at 803. Um, and again, not a major change in the demographics. So older population, 88% coming from old, those older than 65. Um, in terms of our healthcare system, something that we obviously watch very closely, um, our capacity is good at this time, but keeping in mind that um, an increase in cases, uh, there, with an increase in cases, there is a lag potentially of severe outcomes in terms, including hospitalizations and deaths. So something we're watching very closely. Um, in terms of the schools, I'm happy to report that there's minimal secondary transmission. Um, I think a lot of the preventative measures are working in the schools. And in the last two weeks, there's been 29 staff and 68 students, um, something that we track daily. Um, However, with the schools, um, although there, it's not necessarily driving the pandemic, uh, the schools themselves, the schools are a reflection of our community. And if we are to see an increase um, in our, our larger community, that it, it will lead to an increase in our schools as well. So we must all really do our part um, uh, out here as residents. Um, in terms of the metrics, um, uh, and something that we've been working on on, uh, on a regional level, uh, working with Hillsborough and Pasco, uh, there's a group consisting of the healthcare system, the College of Public Health, to look at some of those metrics and review um, uh, some of the trend data. Um, we're going to be looking at the same uh, metrics and indicators that we normally follow and coming up with some uh, agreed upon sort of <sighs> numbers as it pertains to the case count and the percent positivity that has yet to be finalized. Um, so we'll continue to work and definitely keep the board uh, appraised of, of the efforts there. However, given the 
uh, increase in the cases. Uh, we are, again, as uh, Barry mentioned, it's too early to say. Uh, we're going to continue to watch it. We're concerned about how high it's going to peak uh, in terms of the cases, hospitalizations, as well as death. So um, now is not the time to let up on some of these preventative efforts, uh, which does include social distancing and wearing facial coverings. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. And with that, any... we recommend your approval. Right. Do we have any questions of Dr. Cho? Commissioner Welch? I won't mention Commissioner Eggers, I was muted. Um, just to clarify a couple of things, which I think is important because we hear so much, but uh, Dr. Cho, um, the flu shot uh, is still recommended, um, correct? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Um, the, uh, I don't know if you've heard that term, the twindemic, uh, that's uh, COVID cases along with the severe flu season. Uh, so that's what we want to pre prevent. Uh, obviously, that would ease uh, the healthcare system in terms of hospitals, in terms of uh, urgent care visits. So it is something that we recommend. Uh, and I, I, and something I've probably said on every call, it's probably more important uh, to get the flu shot this year than any other year because of the similarities and uh, the, the fact that it may compound that issue. Well, I'll, I'll have you know, I got mine while grocery shopping at a local grocer and <laughs> got a $10 off gift certificate as well. Um, the other thing that we hear, and I just, you know, in the interest of good information, we heard today that, you know, more folks die from the flu than from COVID. Can you speak to that? So I, I know that message has gone out. Uh, there's some reports that indicate, and uh, I think people are referring to the infection uh, fatality rate um, being comparable. I think, to, uh, to be honest, I, I think a jury's still out on that final number as to the, what's the, in terms of fatality rate. What the what people are overlooking, however, is that the uh, what they know and what isn't really argued is the um, that it is more transmissible uh, than the flu. Uh, if if they look at R not values, but uh, the belief is it's more tr transmissible. Uh, beyond that, too, we are vulnerable because we've never seen this type of virus. Our bodies, our immune systems. So uh, this year, until we develop that kind of herd immunity through vaccination efforts, um, that we are going to be especially. Um, uh, uh, especially vulnerable. And then beyond that too, there is that uh, the concerns of these long haulers, these people with post-acute uh, COVID types of symptoms uh, there that we're not sure of. Uh, there's, there may be potential for long-term neurologic uh, and cardiac consequences. So, so that's, it, it's, it's a concern. And, and to be honest, that looking at some of the numbers, and I know it's apples and oranges in terms of how they track some of these numbers, but if you look at it on a national level, the death as it pertains to COVID has been, I can't, I don't know that number now, 215,000 ish. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the annual death as it pertains to the flu has, has averaged over the last few years about 30,000 to 60,000, just by that number alone. Even if you look at the, 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 the ways that you're tracking those two different uh, sort of diseases, it's, it's a huge gap. Well, I, I'm certainly supportive uh, of continuing uh, with the, uh, the order uh, the other thing I would ask uh, maybe to you and to Dr. Jameson is, can we glean anything from what we're seeing in Europe with this second wave and in places that we thought had a handle on it are now even going back into lockdown? Ooh, it's, it's, it's hard to do that predictive type of model. Uh, I, do, I, I did watch some of the curves and the trends in some of the European countries. It's a little bit of a concern. Some for some countries in Europe, um, the peak was just, uh, the second wave was uh, just as bad as their first wave. In other countries, it's actually worse. Um, so it's something that we need to watch carefully and we certainly don't want to get to that point uh, where the peak is even anywhere close to our first wave. As, as you recall, in, in the summer, we were close to, and if not uh, overwhelming the healthcare system, right? They needed to get augmentation staff. and. Uh, we did, of note, start at a higher baseline than even those summer numbers. Uh, to some degree, I think we're better prepared. I think we know more about the virus, but certainly we don't want to put that kind of strain in the healthcare system. Okay. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? I had a question just in general. Do we have any way of knowing, and this is probably not for you, Dr. Cho, but whoever, do we have any way of knowing how many seasonal visitors are not coming this year because they're 
afraid of, particularly, I suppose, from Canada. Um, we, we certainly do get um, our airport numbers. Um, so we have, uh, we get a weekly report on both the airport and uh, from the hotels. Um, that that gives us some idea uh, of the impact of that. And I can give you a more complete report and, and ask CVB to send that over. Um, yeah, what we are seeing, well, what I we are seeing more of snowbirds. Well, of. that's what we're trying to get, to get at. That was, question was asked before. It's a, it's a little bit, it, we, so we can glean that from the um, airport data um, a little harder because we are seeing people uh, take more local trips, which is this time of year, we get more people out of Orlando and stuff coming over and, and, and that's a, a factor in that. But I can give, let me get you a report on that and kind of um, have uh, CBB give you their analysis of what they're seeing. I asked that same question to determine what type of, what, what to expect coming up in comparison right. to past years in terms of people's travel habits. Right, and I, I know I'm hearing anecdotally from places where people come down and live for six months and then go back north. But I was just wondering if there was a more broad way of telling. I yeah, I, and I think it's that likely will change as um, if northern states end up having higher peaks and then they're impo you impose additional restrictions in other states. So we're, that's something we should mm -hmm. we'll put on as a regular report. And so we can discuss that as, as we go forward. Okay. I mean, another way of doing that, I suppose, would be to call around, particularly to those uh, mostly 55 plus communities that have a lot of uh, owners that are six months a year. I mean, uh, the one I've heard from is a uh, travel trailer park where people come down and they're, you know, and, and they've had a lot of people just cancel for this year because they have the other home. Mm -hmm. So well, anyway, we, we can also look at it from um, from a tax standpoint because we have the additional uh, tax for those rentals that are less than six months. So it might maybe another indicator to see uh, if we see widespread changes from previous years. Okay, just wondered. Thank you. Um, okay, I guess we're ready for public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on the local state of emergency, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Madam Chair, it appears we have three people that wish to speak. Our first speaker is Virginia. Uh, Virginia, I don't have a last name, so if you'll unmute and give us your first last name, spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Uh, Virginia Frizzle, F-R-I-Z-Z-L-E, mm -hmm. 149456. Crown Drive, Largo, Florida, 33774. Thank you. <sighs> Breathe. I mean, I know you've heard from me enough. Um, you know, legally, this is not supported. I cannot even believe what I heard from you, Dr. Cho. I mean, even legally, we're supposed to have both sides. I, I call us citizens to allow our a side of a doctor that we choose because obviously there's no truth coming out of Dr. Cho's mouth. That is disgusting, Man, I'm sorry. I will not, but I'm sorry, okay. Rizzle, we will mute you if you continue to attack a person on this panel. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Hey. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I, I don't know, you didn't hear me, anything I just said. Um, Probably just as good. Cho, I can't believe you're lying. Um, we need doctors who can represent the people. Uh, it does say in the law that both sides should be heard. Um, we're only hearing one side and I believe it's totally fake news because I hear that um, masks work totally different as a healthy person. Um, I'm hearing a lot of strep throat, um, microbes in the mask and, and you're making more people sick. and you really are going against the law. There's an emergency man management limitations 2.5, 2.33, where you forestall or mitigate existing danger. In our case pandemic, there are no deaths. You're not even talking about therapeutics whatsoever. And the fact that people are not dying, there's just case pandemic. We're in a case pandemic. It's completely illegal to emergency management 
it, even in a state emergency, you can still get paid for your test and everything you need. You don't need this local emergency management. You lie to everyone that when you tell them that you're only going to get paid if you have a local state of emergency, that's a blatant lie. You're interfering with dissemination of news and comment of public affairs, and you lim limit, modify, or abridge the authority of the governor. Those are three illegal things you're doing, Attorney Jewel White. Why do you allow them to still be unconstitutional? And Chow to lie. You are being unconstitutional. Two, five, three, three. I'm going to ask you to stop now. Time has expired, ma'am, or Madam Chair. Thank you. Our next speaker is Karen Mullins. Ms. Mullins, if you go ahead and unmute and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello, County Commissioners, Dr. Chow, um, and fellow staff. Uh, fellow staff. Uh, my name is Karen Mullins, M U L L I N S, Dunning, Florida. I want to say that I uh, applaud you for your support in the state of emergency. Um, you guys are doing a wonderful job. I just want to commend each and every one of you. I stand by you. Thank you for what you're doing. And um, especially the chair. I, I, <laughs> I just can't imagine what the chair is going through right now. And I really appreciate you all being there for the public, allowing me to go where I need to go um, in this pandemic. Without the mask mandate, I could not, I could not operate. So thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Madam Chair, and we have three remaining speakers. Our next speaker is on the phone line, last four digits, 9719. If you'll unmute yourself and give us your first, last name, spelling, and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello? We're having terrible luck with phone this, numbers. This is, this is the same person that had trouble last time, Brian. Yeah. They unmute last time somehow. They're unmuted, so I don't know what's going on. We'll have to go to our next speaker. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Don Bowler. Uh, Ms. Bowler, if you'll go ahead and unmute and give us your address for the record, spelling it as for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sorry, I hit something so I tried to mess it up. Um, Don Bowler, Easy Boy, O A L E R, live in St. Pete. Just have a question out of curiosity. Um, the cold season right now, and I had read that the fronts that we get that bring the lower humidity and or the cooler air tends to trigger the cold season. And it goes from about now till, oh, it was, I think it was March. I can't remember the exact date, but I was just kind of curious when it comes to COVID-19 and cold, since they both stem from coronavirus, what distinguishes the two apart when testing? And is it possible that if we have the cold season, this is a common cold, could that be potentially a reason for the uptick in numbers? No, that was just my question. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Michelle Moore. Uh, welcome back, Ms. Moore. If you go ahead and unmute, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello again. Um, I. Uh... Last time I got a little nervous actually, so I didn't get to say everything I wanted to say. Um, first, I, I did wanna say that um, you guys are, are very well supported. Um, I know a lot of local residents from my friends and family who very much support you guys, the mandates that you are creating. Um, but a lot of people, you know, we're, we're working right now. Um, I'm actually taking off um, an hour um, from work so I could be here. Um, it's been hard for me to attend past meetings and show my support. So I just wanna let you guys know that even though sometimes people might be a little bit unpleasant towards you, you do have a lot of support in the community. And unfortunately this is a job that can't please everyone. Um, but the second point I wanted to make about needing the mask mandate is I feel like a lot of people are referencing that there's not a lot of deaths apparently. Um, not enough people have died, which um, seems horrible. Um, but it's not just about trying to prevent deaths. It's also trying to keep people healthy, both old and young. I'm a millennial. Um, and even though um, media keeps telling me that I should be fine, um, what if I catch it and I'm not, I might not die, 
but I don't have the greatest health insurance in the world. I have a very high $10,000 deductible that I don't know how I would pay if I ended up getting hospitalized. Um, and um, if I missed out on work, a lot of people are hourly workers. A lot of people are single parents. They can't really afford to get sick. So even though death might not be the biggest concern here, I think just staying relatively healthy. We also are still learning about the long-term repercussions of if you catch it and you might have maybe lung issues down the line, you might be more susceptible to being ill down the line in your life. So I think if we could try to just stay healthy, I think I think that's the biggest thing. And it's, it is simply a piece of cloth. It's, it's not, I mean, we wear seat belts, we have to wear pants, you know, there's other things that we all have to do that we don't really say inhibit on our freedoms. And I think this is a very simple thing and it is really comes down to just a small act of kindness and the mask doesn't matter. It People saying, oh, if you wanna wear a mask, you wear it, but I don't want to, but that kind of defeats the purpose because the mask prevents the sick person from making someone else sick. So we all have to wear the mask. And that's just kind of what I wanted to say today. Thank you. Thank you. And Madam Chair, we have no other hands that are in the air. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's move on to the regular agenda then. Uh, no. no, wait. Oh. Need a vote. <laughs> Need okay. a vote. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I forgot where I was. Yes. I move extension of the order, and I do have one comment. Second. Uh, okay. Go ahead and make your comment. The, the comment, again, I just, um, in terms of just facts, um, one of the callers mentioned that there haven't been any deaths, which is just patently absurd. Today's report from the state of Florida shows that we've had 24 thousand cases and 800 deaths, 803 deaths. In, in Pinellas Pin County. In Pinellas County. So I just wanted to state that for the record. Thank you. Yeah. And if you don't know somebody that's died, right. good for you. But yeah. I do. So Commissioner Eggers. Um, yeah, I, you know, first of all, I just really wanted to, uh, to thank, uh, again, thank our, our health uh, professionals for the, for the work that they continue to do. And, um, yeah, this is um, this is obviously very trying for everybody, and um, just you know, hoping that people continue to to listen to what is being said out there. And um, and I just so people know, I get we get we all get lots of emails in, and and I and I'm reading all of them, and I do poor Dr. Cho and Dr. Jamison, I do send some of those some of those emails to them, so that they can continue to you know, to, to, to be challenged, if you will, to look at what's being presented and to look through it and talk about it and talk to each other about it and try to be open-minded in their own conversations that, so that they, when they come to us, they're, 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 they're bringing a lot of that with them in addition to doing their own research continually. Um, and, um, and so anyway, I just wanna make sure that the folks understand and to the folks that called in and said they had several doctors, um, I'd, I'd welcome you to send that information in as well, and uh, and uh, and any back you know information that they might have, so we can look at that as well. So I continue to to say that our doctors are being open minded. They are talking to each other. They are trying to do all the research out there to bring us to a safe place in terms of making a a, a recommendation um, for for the continued state of emergency. So um, I, I don't think it's just being done flippantly. Anybody who says that otherwise, I think is, is just not listening to the to the work that's going on here. Um, again, thank you for your time, appreciate it. Um, Dr. Cho, can you address the question that we got about the difference between a cold and COVID, particularly how you differentiate them in testing? So, so I, I think I think the question as it would pertain, uh, if I recall, uh, the cross reactivity with the common coronaviruses. There are four common seeds of coronaviruses out there, uh, and usually um, uh, a lot of the hospitals have these panels that that if, when tested and collected, that they um, run a test on a number of, of um, viruses, respiratory viruses out there, what they call the respiratory viral panels. Um, what they've targeted, especially with the PCR testing that's available for coronavirus, I mean COVID. That it does differentiate um, from the seasonal um, coronavirus, so it, it shouldn't be contributing as much. In fact, uh, the, a lot of the companies and the hospitals are now moving towards, especially for the hospitalized patients, that a, a viral panel that does now include the COVID virus specifically. So not only they test the, the regular respiratory panel, they have that addition of that COVID virus. COVID. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, we have a motion from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Long. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, item carries 5 0. Item uh, 25. This is an interlocal agreement with the Barrier Island uh, municipalities authorizing the surcharge, the sur sales surtax for the Golf Boulevard Improvement Plan. Um, as uh, as we originally set that up in our local agreement. Move approval. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, um, do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Eggers. <clears throat> yeah, Barry, if you could just, uh, just so for when folks are watching, um, we, you know, we, uh, we kind of, I guess mapped out the penny usage for the, this penny four uh, at somewhere originally around 90, 90 million a year for the county uh, portion of that. Uh, it's been brought back a little bit with the, you know, with the, some of the economic effects. But could you give some perspective as to what kind of commitment we're talking about here in penny funds over the next four or five years as it relates to that annual amount? Because I just want people to continue to appreciate where a lot of the funds that they're paying for are going? Um, well, <laughs> I don't have those figures in front of me. Um, so uh, Brian Loak just popped in. He does have some of that history. This is what we're talking about on this particular item is we did set aside 35 million as part of the penny. We took that off the top um, as part of the penny project. Uh, and the idea was, was to consolidate and allow everybody along uh, the, the municipalities that had not done their undergrounding to consolidate down into one project, be easier to manage. Um, as we went through the project design and got cost figures in, uh, it exceeded the budget of the 35 million. And so the decision um, was made in conjunction with municipalities to distribute it under the original formula to the municipalities and they can get as much done as they can within their particular jurisdictions. Um, over, so we're still holding that true that 35 million is coming off the top and the overall penny, it is true, uh, dependent upon the recovery that we will have less penny money coming in. And so we're going to have to make some decisions, uh, as we get further along in that and see what the recovery is on that. It was originally projected at about 6%, uh, based upon, uh, the uh, impact of COVID. Uh, but again, that's, um, that's one, you know, flip in time. And we'll have to watch that with the recovery and see how our sales tax uh, goes. Yeah, and I just again, Barry. I, I mean, just looking at the staffing as you were speaking, um, and I wanted you know maybe just get confirmation on this, but it's showing somewhere around three million this year, and then eight million for the next four years of of penny funding. Uh, so, and again, if that's if that's accurate, again, that's why I was asking the question. But uh, it represents you know in the, the next four years about. Little, little over 10% of the monies that are available to us for a lot of, uh, of, of things that we want to get done here in the county. It's, it's, a, it's a large commitment is what I'm getting at. So, It was a large commitment, but again, it was, predates me, but my understanding was a commitment that was made as part of the Penny Projects. And so we've tried I'm not, to- I'm not, I'm not speaking yeah. against it. No, I know. I'm, I'm just, just, I'm just saying, it, it, but that was yeah. for the public. That was the, we're trying to hold with that. But we do understand that we're not cutting this down uh, based upon a projection. And so overall, we're going to have to see how the recovery is because it will come out of future dollars that we're going to have. Brian, if you wanted to add anything, feel free. Not much. I would just say you are correct. Um, it is a five-year um, commitment of those funds, allocation of funds. Year one will be $3 million and years two through five will be $8 million each. They've got an additional year to submit um, for any reimbursement and any, any reimbursements not submitted uh, by the expiration of this agreement will not be eligible for reimbursement. Um, so as far to answer your question, Commissioner Eggers, um, that, that's what I would add. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Uh, ma Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Uh, before we go on to our next item, I want to ask, and I forgot, and I should have done it while Dr. Cho was still here, my understanding is that uh, the Hillsborough County Commission is going to move to add language to their ordinance on testing. And I wondered if Dr. Cho could come back and talk to us about 
what their update is and whether or not we might consider doing the same thing um, just so that we're all working in conjunction with one another. Well, well, we can ask, go ahead. I was gonna say, I don't think we have him on the broadcast we, anymore. We, we can ask No, him. I know we don't. I know he's gone, but I just wanted to make mention so that between the chair and Barry, maybe we could find out um, how, how, that how that may or may not impact us and some of our facilities. Well, I'm not familiar with what they're proposing to change, but I will tell you that we are working in conjunction with, as we, as I had mentioned at our last report, with both Pasco and Hillsborough County to coordinate things like that. Um, I know he was on a call last Friday with the health director of both Pasco, Hillsborough, and Hillsborough County. Um, Correct. So I, I can certainly follow up with him. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, Brian, do we have any? Uh, public would that would like to speak to this issue at this time if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 25 please raise your hand virtually in the zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone and madam chair we do have somebody with their hand we have two people with their hands up uh, both on the telephone line we'll start with last four digits nine two nine four if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your first last name spelling and address you'll have three minutes to address the board hello can you hear me yes sir Hi, my name is Mike Brutzman. Uh, I live in Whisper on Whispering Pines Drive in uh, Clearwater, Florida. Uh, I was trying to call in earlier. There were some technical difficulties, apparently. Um, calling in reference to agenda item 24 uh, with my chance to speak. The first thing I would like to address is uh, the approach from the regional committee, which is acting as the interjurisdictional committee. Again, uh, I've listened to Dr. Holt from Pasco or from Hillsborough and Mike Napier from Pasco. Uh, and they're actually saying that they are making decisions based on the committee um, and the region's approach um, and what they're being told from the health experts. I would also like to say that I want to uh, ask the Pinellas County Commissioner, uh, Commission Board to post the minutes from these Department of Health meetings um, that seem to only incorporate Pasco and Hillsborough uh, counties respectively. Uh, there doesn't happen to be any other uh, parties privy unless uh, there is. We'd like to see the, the attendance record of that. Uh, and that's why I'm requesting that. Uh, again, uh, echoing a lot of people uh, and their concerns with masks, I will say uh, for real science, CDC came out with a study that said 85% uh, of people uh, wore masks that, that did, in fact, contract COVID, 70% uh, of those being habitual mask wearers. Uh, I also wanted to bring up a, a fact uh, that I tried to uh, submit a complaint about the statute 252.38 violation to the Pinellas County Inspector General. Uh, that was not heard, uh, and there seemed to be a conflict of interest. So I've taken that to the state now, and I will deal with the statute uh, violations from there, uh, including the notification to the uh, division. Uh, I also want to talk about businesses and uh, PPP loans. So uh, businesses locally in the area are able to, uh, a restaurant specifically, are able to operate 100% for Executive Order 244 from Ron uh, DeSantis. Uh, they're self-imposing a capacity restriction, but they've accepted millions of dollars uh, up to the 200 millions of dollars in PPP loan. Uh, if they are self-imposing capacity restrictions and took government money because they couldn't operate at capacity, uh, I'm moving that they give that money back. Uh, I don't see a reason why that they would take uh, government money in those instances and then self uh, limit their capacities because of the exact reason they filed for a uh, government loan, uh, which is backed by the taxpayer. Uh, so I wanted to cover those things. And uh, I do want to talk about masks from a perspective of we're not looking at any other health conditions from uh, the health experts, uh, suicides, domestic violence, everything that's on the rise is the commissioner's board willing uh, to talk to mothers and fathers of uh, kids and teenagers or loved ones of those who, that have committed suicide due to uh, unconstitutional restrictions uh, that could have adverse effects on anxiety and depression. Uh, sorry, we need you, to look at this holistically. Your, your time has expired, you. sir. I'm sorry. Madam Chair, we have one other person that wishes to be heard on this item. Last four digits, 2157. Uh, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, you'll have three minutes to address the board. I'm supposed to be as calm as that other caller. I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, can you give us your first last name, spelling, and address for the record? 14946 
Crown Drive, Virginia Frizzle. I don't appreciate you bringing up the only thing about death instead of me mentioning all about these laws. Obviously, I apologize to everybody who thinks that I don't care about death. That is not the case. The point was the case pandemic. I did owe the last caller because none of you are paying attention to any of that. And he just repeated everything I said. But for you to point out the thing I said about death, you all, that's awful of you because you know I've called plenty of times and that's not what I'm about. I'm about you breaking the laws. And Barry Burton, I never heard at all that you are a constitutional employee or that you, how many hours you have in emergency management other than I got something that you were uh, things I don't couldn't even find in your past resumes that didn't <laughs> confirm any of that. So uh, though we are not going to we are not going to listen to this. I've asked you not to attack people on this panel. And if you continue, you will be muted and you will not be allowed to comment again during this meeting. And Madam Chair, there's no other speakers on this item. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have a, I think, <laughs> a motion from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Long, right? Yeah. This is on Gulf uh, Boulevard, right? This is on Gulf Boulevard, okay. yes, thank you. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Item 26. This is a um, resolution to enter into an agreement with Duke Energy Clean Energy Connection Program. As you recall, when we briefed you, this is for the purchase of solar energy. Uh, we originally requested 68, um, whatever, megawatts of um, solar energy. We were provided 27.3. Um, what, what we did is, and you can see within the uh, details of the program, did a cost-effective analysis and it's actually cheaper. It saves us money in the long run. We can get out of this agreement at any point. So if the rates raised where it's no longer cost-effective, um, but this adds to our uh, green footprint. We uh, believe that this is a positive step forward over 30 years of the program and we would recommend um, its approval. Move approval, Madam Chair. Okay. Second. Right, second. All right. Any questions? Yes, Mr. Eggers. Um, yeah, just I mean, one of the parts in here. I mean, there was a lot of a uh, lot of staffing behind this, but one of the parts in here was that um, you know um, fees will not be expended until two thousand two. 22, when Duke is expected to officially begin the program. In total, over 30 years in the program, the county will pay an estimated 78 million in subscription fees and receive an estimated 88 million in bill credits, in, 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 equating to a $9,000 return on investment. Nine million. Excuse me, excuse me. Thank you. That little three digits I missed. <laughs> Apologize. Nine million dollars return on investment. So I just wanted to, you know, again, these are things that we're committing to as we go along. If things don't pan out, as Barry said, we can get out um, with a month's notice. But the idea of getting this kind of energy and at the same time having a, a good return to our taxpayers, our residents, uh, is a good thing. So thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, Brian, do we have any comment? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 26, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. And Madam Chair, there's nobody that wishes to comment on this agenda item. All right, thank you. There are no further questions. All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Item carries 5 0. Uh, item 27. It's a contract with the state of Florida Department of Health for the operation of the Florida Department of Health. This is broken down into two pieces, uh, 5.5 million for core services and 1.5 million for the uh, school nurse program. Move approval. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Questions? Do we have any comments, Brian? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 27, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. And Madam Chair, there's nobody that wishes to comment. Okay, if there are no questions or comments, all in favor, please raise your hand. Item carries five zero. Item 28. This is a notice of a grant award with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. 
uh, for fiscal year 2020 capital assistance. Um, this actually will add 1,200 square feet to the Bayside Health Clinic. Uh, so this is a one-time funding uh, for the project. This will enable them to add additional exam rooms, um, handle, um, have like isolation and negative pressure, um, and then also have uh, the current exams rooms be renovated. So significant expansion of uh, our healthcare uh, services to um, that um, to our homeless population. Cool. Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Um, Barry, um, uh, it says uh, it will. It was awarded eight hundred eleven thousand to increase the square footage. Do we have an idea what that cost is going to be? And um, our, I guess we, do we, we paid the difference, I'm, I'm assuming, from a capital perspective. And then how does that add to our ongoing um, operating costs? Does it mean anything additionally as far as that goes, Barry? Well, I'm just looking in my notes. I, I think that is the cost. Um, so That is the cost? Yeah, as far as I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask staff to confirm that as we're speaking. Um, I Obviously, I can't flip back into the... Uh, into anything else, but my understanding is that's the cost. Um, and um, uh, so, yeah, it's only a 1200 square foot addition. Well, yeah, but that, yeah, I understand that's, you know, that's a, it's a sizable, that's a sizable amount. So I was just curious if that was covering all of it, including the equipment or if it's just, or is, is the balance going to come to us or is that the complete cost? That was what I was asking. Yeah. Let me, let me check on that and, and okay. I'll, I'll give you a report while we're speaking. Okay. Any other uh, questions? Did you want to motion now or you want to wait until that information? Uh, uh, Lourdes just texted me, said, yes, that's the total cost. That's the total cost. Okay, so it's about being completely covered by the, uh, the grant. Thank you, appreciate that. So yes, I want a motion now. Move approval, <laughs> Madam Chair. Second. Okay. All right, Brian, do we have any? Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 28, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Madam Chair, nobody wishes to comment on this item. Okay. If there are no further questions, all in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Item carries 5-0. Item 29. This is a behavioral health uh, consulting services contract with KPMG. Uh, to implement the optimal data, data set, which is phase two within our strategic plan for our, our adult behavioral health system. Um, after, that follows the conclusion for phase one with the two follow-on items. Um, so this gets us going. We wanted to get that uh, out the door as quickly as possible so uh, we can begin uh, working on this. Move approval. Second. Thank you. Uh, do we have any Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Barry, um, maybe Lourdes could weigh in on this just for clarity so that I know we had some discussion at the last meeting and I just wanna make sure that we're clear that uh, there's that this is phase one is completed. So these two, this recommendation is for phase two right. and there's a, there's a phase three to this. So could you talk about the idea that we, that we said before, or at least I mentioned before, and I know others have talked about it where we would we, there might be some things we can do in parallel, but there also might be some things that are best waited till we st finish a phase. If you could just talk to that as to, are we getting to it as, as, as most effectively as we can to the end game, the end product. Um, so just speak to that just for a few minutes, please. You have to have performance-based contracts in order to be able to move to phase three. And so phase two gets us into where we're really talking about this, these performance-based contracts and kind of changing that to where we're having outcome with the, all the different individual service providers. Uh, so this is a key piece to be able to move to um, the phase three model, which is a coordinated access model. As we get into this, we can advance funds. We set aside funds within um, our reserves to where if, if, if everybody believes that, we're, that that's gonna occur in a quick time period, I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that it will. Um, history tells us it's going to be very complicated, um, and so you know, and it's going to take time. But if we're if we're wildly successful, we will come to you with a specific plan for moving to phase three. Phase phase three also, though, as we talk about a coordinated access model, 
um, has to include the players coming forward with funding sources to be able to move to that and agreeable to the sharing of data and information in terms of how they would approach something like that. That's the reason phase two is key. And that's gonna lay the groundwork for moving into, uh, or phase two is key. That's gonna lay the groundwork for moving into phase uh, three. There is nothing being slowed down. We're moving um, a, in record speed in terms of being able to have a model where we can change the way in which the services are coordinated. Um, and so if we're successful and we move that forward quicker, we will bring that to you quicker. Um, but we've got to get people playing together, working together, and really get to this optimal data set that'll be the key indicator of how successful we're going to be in a phase three coordinated model. And, I'm, and I've heard and I'm assuming that our, our partners, our community partners, are behind this approach. Um, they, they are working together. Um, they are, I think everybody's waiting to see how, uh, th what that means. Um, and so, you know, we've had a lot of past efforts and tried to trying to coordinate uh, different types of activities. Um, so I think everybody's at the table and they're wanting to do that. I think keep KPMG, the reason we hired them is because of their success in working with other jurisdictions. Sometimes people need to see a success model and bringing um, experience from around the country, I think has helped people to where it's, they're not so defensive about their, in, their, their particular um, jurisdiction. Um, and so hopefully by bringing them to the table, we'll be able to break through some of the um, past um, uh, issues and be able to move towards a more coordinated model. Yeah, I was, I was really speaking more to the being behind the process that we're going to, not necessarily the outcomes, because well, we're not there yet. So, um, yeah. So, and, uh, I think, and I think over the last five years, you know, we've we've seen a lot of places that the, this is a fair. Some of these integrated models are really fairly new, and success. You know, pe people want to be part of successful patterns. So, I think bringing that experience to the table will really help. Um, uh, move this forward. And I'm, I am very hopeful that we'll be able to do this sooner rather than later. And that's the reason the meeting after you approve the budget, we wanted to start this process and get that going. And I, and last, last comment or question is they, in the first phase, there was an awful lot of interviewing that, that, that this group did. And I, and of course they interviewed our, our, our community partners as well as a part of that phase one question mark. Okay. Lourdes, you can speak to that, and, and um, if, but the answer is yes. Uh, they talked to all community partners. Um, it, was, it was key to get kind of the foundational issue. Was, it was really, you know, preparing the field to be able to build the team. Yeah, thank you. All the partners, uh, lots of providers, hospitals, judges, law enforcement, uh, public defender, state attorney's office. Um, just about everyone you could imagine uh, was, was interviewed for this. And when we go on to this next phase on the optimal data set, we will also bring in the providers um, and get their viewpoints on it. I think that was also part of your question, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, and it was. Thank Florida you. Health Network, who is the largest funder, right, the state of Florida, um, they have indicated, Linda McKinnon, the CEO, that she is on board with this um, and agrees with it as well. Yeah, thank you, Lourdes. That's kind of what I was looking for, that last part about them, you know, buying into the process. I think that's really important. So when we get to the end that they've come along, uh, and I just wanted to just reiterate that. So thank you for, for doing that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, Brian, do we have any comments? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item number 29, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. And Madam Chair, there's nobody that wishes to comment. Okay, so we have a motion from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Long. All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you, item carries five zero, item 30. This is the Pinellas Gateway Mid-County Area Master Plan implementation. This is a memorandum of understanding uh, between uh, Pinellas County, City of Largo, City of Pinellas Park, City of St. Petersburg, and Forward Pinellas. Move approval. Second. Okay. Questions? Uh, Any comments, Brian? Oh, sorry, Commissioner Eggers. 
No, I mean, I, you know, I just thought this might be a good opportunity. And again, I'm not wanting to make an, a long presentation. There's a short presentation here that really, I think, could speak to the, you know, residents of Pinellas County that, that, that really right in the center of our county, there's an awful lot of work being done as far as the future goes between, you know, multiple juris, you know, groups, uh, Largo, St. Petersburg, you know, uh, Clearwater, uh, Pinellas County unincorporated areas. So a lot of work has come together. Uh, I really wanted to, to, to give a shout out to Forward Pinellas for their role in all this in terms of pulling the different groups together. And, and I thought that I know there's a, a, a presentation in here, but you know, again, I don't want to dive into all the details, but I think just giving folks an, a sense of what, what, what we're doing and what's going on here would be helpful. So we have Evan Johnson on the line. He can either speak to it or have a short presentation uh, depending on what your uh, pleasure is. However he best feels he can get across <laughs> the points of his presentation, which I think is like eight, eight or nine slides that he could go through pretty quickly, but it's up to him. Let me see if I can get Evan here. I think he's coming in under a different name. So give me one moment. Evan, are you coming in under, under Cynthia Watkins? Can you can can you unmute yourself? That looks like me. That is you. You're not Cynthia. Let me change your name here. <laughs> um, actually, I was going to say, um, I believe we have a couple of representatives, uh, Whit Blanton and Chelsea uh, Favreau, who were yeah. here to make a presentation. Uh, uh, I, I think they just wanted to kind of hit the highlights. Right. Exactly. So I know that they were waiting. Um, if we want to no, I, I, if you can speak to it, that'd be great. Oh, okay, sure. So um, yes, as Commissioner Eggers, um, as you mentioned, uh, this has been a multi-year effort now that has been was led by uh, Ford Pinellas. Um, we've those jurisdictions each contributed financially to looking at a long-term master plan for the gateway area, which includes everything from from the unincorporated perspective, includes um, the airport area. Um, includes the, the, the gateway, um, uh, Carillon, all of that in that area as well. And we really looked at uh, mobility, multimodal transportation, as well as kind of long-term land use um, uh, changes that could occur within the area. So really the, 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 and I can, the plan itself um, has a series of recommendations, including looking at Kind of balancing economic development, transportation needs, as well as environmental sustainability. As you all know, this is an area that is very low, uh, has a lot of floodplains um, within the area. And so making sure that we address those resiliency items moving forward um, was something that was uh, definitely at the forefront of this, this planning effort. What we're doing with the memorandum of uh, understanding is really agreeing as a collective to work together under the uh, ongoing leadership of Ford Pinellas um, uh, to incorporate recommendations uh, as we move forward and look at CIP projects, um, land use planning, zoning, et cetera. We're gonna make sure that we um, are reviewing those recommendations uh, from the master plan and that uh, we are incorporating them as much as possible in our uh, investments moving forward. And the last thing I wanted to mention was Ford Pinellas will, as you'll see in the agreement, they're going to be tracking, um, identifying, working with all of our partners to identify metrics moving forward. And we'll be tracking those over time to show progress in how working together, we've been able to accomplish some of those goals. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. And I just think that goes to the, the I think, really, the, the conversation between the groups and how going forward, it's going to be really important on critical issues. For instance, one is um, how we deal with our industrial lands and um, what, you know, recent uh, state efforts have done to, uh, you know, say that, you know, local jurisdictions have control over those, uh, those industrial lands more so than we had previously had some degree of say in that. So how they how we work on uh, affordable housing or any kind of housing within industrial and how much of it's left for industrial is going to be really important that we have a countywide approach and discussion. And this will be this is a great opportunity for these groups to talk about an area that's filled with opportunities for jobs, land for that opportunity for uh, some housing opportunities and how they're all going to work together. And you mentioned the stormwater and the environmental aspect. And again, those three competing interests for, for, for land are going to be critical that we look at. And it's nice to have these 
different uh, groups working together. Um, so thank you, Evan, appreciate it. Of course, thank you. Thank you, any other questions? Okay, uh, do we have any comments, Brian? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item number 30, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting and hit star nine on the telephone. And Madam Chair, there's nobody that wishes to comment on this agenda item. Move approval, please. Thank Second. <laughs> are you there? Yes, okay. I'm sorry. I had to stand up for a moment <laughs> right here. Okay. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Eggers, second from Commissioner Long. All in favor, please raise your hand. All right, motion carries 5-0, uh, 31. Yeah, you have six now. Oh, I have six? Yeah. Oh, I can't, okay. Oh, I think you have Commissioner Seal also that has her hand up. Okay, great, Six zero then. I'm done with canvassing for the day. Yay. Oh, yay! Thank you. <laughs> All right, item 31. This is a resolution granting an ad valorem tax exemption for the renovation of a historic property uh, located in St. Petersburg. Move approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Long. Do we have any comments, Brian? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 31, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Madam Chair, there is nobody that wishes to comment. Hey, um, do we, we need a motion, I believe? Thank you, Heather. Move approval. Did I get one? Okay. Yeah. All in favor, raise your hands. All right. Did you get that? Kat, Kat did you get that? Yeah. All right. Um, yes, motion to six zero. What? She said she got it, six zero. Okay, great. I could have sworn we didn't get okay 32 um and again this is agreement for the reuse of existing plans with aacom technical services for design services for the starkey road improvement project uh kelly levy is on the line and can answer questions that you had uh, from last thursday regarding the um how we can use plans from 2008 and it still be viable so um <laughs> she's on the line and we'll, we'll let her uh let her explain that to you all right hi good Good afternoon. Um, yes, uh, there was a, a, some question, uh, some follow-up questions with regard to the project management team. Uh, the project manager is the same project manager from when the project was originally designed, as well as some of the support staff. So yes, they will be part of that team and leading that effort. I also wanted to clarify um, why some of the aspects of the project had to be redesigned. Unfortunately, when plans are put on the shelf, um, a lot of the standards change. And so all of that has to be updated. They age very quickly. And so for example, in the plans that were put on the shelf at the time, the standard for a bike lane was four feet. And now that standard is seven feet. So we have to go through and update those plans. And the cost associated with that was um, about $336,000 for updating those components of the plan. Then there was $100,000 set aside for community engagement, um, assisting us during the construction process um, so that they were um, you know, part of the team and helping us address any issues in the field. And then there was uh, $375,000 that is uh, set for um, developing the plans for utility relocation. The utility relocation plans were not completed as part of the original design. Okay, questions? Okay, we'll entertain a motion. Move of approval, Madam Chair. Second. Second. Okay, uh, okay we have a motion from Commissioner Long, second from Commissioner Welch. Do we have any comments, Brian? At this time, <laughs> if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item number 32, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Madam Chair, we have nobody that wishes to comment on this item. Okay, well, all in favor then, please raise your hand. Motion carries 6-0, thank you. Item 33. 
Item 33 is the third amendment to an agreement with Oracle. Uh, this is for all of our software and licensing uh, for our ERP system. Um, again, this is a three year extension. Move approval. Second. <laughs> all right. Any questions? Comments, Brian? This time, if there are any members of the public who wish to comment on agenda item 33, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Madam Chair, there's nobody that wishes to comment. Madam okay. Chair. Yes, sir. Just wanted to comment. This is a, a large expenditure, but both OBAC and the BTS board have gone over this extensively. And I, and I misspoke. It's to your extension, not three. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah. Uh, uh, Commissioner Welch, is that, uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe somebody else is here from staff that the the annual amount seems to be going down a little bit. Is that, am I, am I seeing that right? Um, it, it's a, it's a good story to tell. So I, I think um, if um, staff is here to talk about that, how we got to that process, because I believe we got here when the clerk had some questions about us outsourcing support. And it actually ended up with us renegotiating and getting a lower rate on the maintenance. But and uh, Greg Caro is here from BTS, sure. and he can speak to that. But you're you're seeing that you know different. And and I I will speak to one thing just for the commissioners. We're we're really looking, and BTS and Jeff's taking the lead on this for really kind of creating a strategic plan um, about where all of our technology services are going. This is a classic example from when you implemented something where you all had to be part of one system and now different pieces, uh, they're spinning off into standalone, but they integrate and they talk to each other. So um, that that really does speak to, you can speak to it, Greg, re, uh, specifically regarding uh, the reduction in this, uh, this contract. Well, it's spot on, uh, Greg Caro with BTS. Um, the reduction um, is through the negotiation with Oracle to reduce our unused entitlements. So this was uh, an, an, um, an unlimited license agreement aggressively negotiated originally back in 2010. And since then, um, to Mr. Burton, you know, we've, we've reduced our usage in certain areas um, and uh, didn't use certain products. So Oracle's worked with us to uh, reduce these entitlements and with significant savings on an annual basis. Uh, and we continue to further reduce uh, reduce the uh, unused entitlements where it's appropriate. Yeah, I, I thought that I just thought that was a great story. I mean, I, I'm looking at 2017s at over four million, 2018s at two million, and then we're looking at the next two years about 1.8 million a year. And I mean, that's just a, I think that's great work. And you know, I don't want to uh, speak what, what you were going to speak to Commissioner Welch, but I mean, just good story. So thank you. Well, and if, uh, and if, go ahead. if I could make one, this is my last tech comment, I think. Um, just <laughs> actually in cleaning the office and justice, feel free not to say anything. Um, I came across the old, and I'm going to send it to you all. We did a schematic of all the payroll systems just to input a payroll mm. check that existed before we moved to this. And everybody had their own thing, but they didn't talk to each other. And I just, you know, you look at retiring the mainframe, moving to Oracle, the Tyler system in Sieges, and I think this sets us up when this ends in two two years or so to that next big step in our technology. And maybe Brian or Jeff can talk to that. But what's on the horizon for us in, in a couple of years, uh, whether it's totally cloud-based or what do you see next for us? Do you want me uh, to try to tackle that or Greg? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Go so, ahead, Greg. so, so we are we are um, in the midst of hiring a third party uh, consultant. Uh, we contract with Gardner uh, to help us with a strategic roadmap and to find and or to answer the that that same that same question. And so, you know, we've been on this path for a decade. Very aggressive, successful implementation. A lot of business uh, process reengineering that went along with that um, consolidation of many, many systems and internal business processes. So we've been humming along for quite some time now. And now uh, the technology space has, has changed significantly. Uh, there's a lot of other offerings out there, but still it's a significant task to undertake to re-implement your ERP system. 
uh, enterprise resource planning system. So uh, we're looking forward to that engagement and we're looking to uh, have that engagement the first quarter of this fiscal year. And uh, then we may have some more answers as far as what our, you know, two and three year trajectory is. Exciting stuff. All right. Uh, did I ask if we have any comments, Brian? Uh, no, but I will ask now, Madam Chair. Uh, at this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item number 33, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And actually, you know what? We might have asked for comment on this. And I don't think anybody raised their hand. So that's the case for the second time. I apologize. Okay. We gave them two shots at it. <laughs> All right. We have a, a motion from Commissioner Welsh, second from Commissioner Long. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries 6 0, item 34. Um, these are reappointments to the Emergency Medical Services Advisory Council, and they're listed on your um, standard sheet. Okay, and I think we can take one motion for them all. Of approval. Second. Second. Okay. Um, we have a motion from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Seal. Uh, Questions? Do we have any comments, Brian? And this is for agenda items 34 and 35? Uh, or no, I'm sorry, just 30, 34. 34. 34. 34. Okay. Yeah. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 34, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. And Madam Chair, there's nobody that wishes to comment on this item. Okay. Uh, well then, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, item carry six zero, item 35. These are amendments to the Emer Emergency Medical Services Advanced Life Support First Responder Agreements with four municipalities and two independent fire districts uh, being Clearwater, Gulfport, Palm Harbor, uh, Sun uh, Pinell Suncoast, Tarpon Springs, and Treasure Island. These are consistent with um, the fiscal year 2021 budget. Move approval, Madam Chair. Second. Okay. Do we have any questions? Okay, uh, comments from the... Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 35, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And there's nobody that wishes to comment on this item. Okay, there are no questions. All in favor, please raise your hand. Item carry six zero. Item 36, uh, Madam Attorney. So under item number 36, uh, this is a case that would have been brought forward in accordance with the confidential memorandum, which is um, my process for bringing uh, such confidential items forward to you. As you all know, I spoke with each one of you and I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different today uh, than what we had originally proposed. This case, the Rainer case, went to an arbitration panel. Uh, it's, been, it's been about a couple weeks ago uh, at this point. We thought that we would have the decision from that panel in advance of this meeting. Uh, it is necessary for the county to take action once we get that decision to either accept it or reject it. Uh, we did not get the decision uh, in advance of this meeting. And given the time constraints that we have to respond to that, which is 20 days, we do not think there will be enough time to bring that matter back before the commission at its next meeting, which is not until November 17th. So, and let me back up a minute. If there is potentially a delay in us getting that decision long enough that we could bring it back to you at your November meeting, we will certainly look to do that. However, since I do not anticipate that being the case, what I would request the board take action today to do is to delegate the authority to the county administrator to work in conjunction with my office to make a decision to accept or reject the decision of the arbitration panel within 20 days of when we receive it. Okay. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay. I'll entertain a motion. Move approval. Thank you. Second. Second. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. 
we have any comments on that, Brian? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 36, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And we don't have any comments, Madam Chair. Okay. In that case, all in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Item carries six zero. Item uh, oh, 37, Madam Attorney, do you have anything else? I do not. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Administrator, what you got? Yes, sir. Um, uh, today is actually very exciting. So the U.S. Department of uh, Justice and the Bureau of Justice Assistance um, just awarded to Pinellas County a $1.2 million uh, grant to work on co uh, comprehensive opioid stimulant and substance abuse site uh, based programs. So what this will do is, and so we, when we presented to you on our opioid initiative and you funded a portion within the budget, we knew that we were hopeful that we were gonna have grant funds to be able to extend that out and really make that program work. Well, this grant um, that was pending at the time will really help with our opioid intervention. We will uh, provide periodic updates on uh, our partnerships, but with human services, in partnership with safety and emergency services, they're gonna partner with our local law enforcement, the op opioid task force and treatment providers for on-site intervention, expedited access to substance use treatment and peer engagement services. This is really a lot of what Lourdes was talking about back when we had a presentation specifically talking about that item. This will conduct overdose uh, fatality reviews to identify trends, identify potential gaps in the system of care it will also increase first responder and community accent, um, access uh, to, to naloxone. So um, this is an exciting grant. This will provide um, a significant amount of resources paired with the funding that you provided to really make a difference. We're going to target those places where we know uh, we have the highest use and uh, create those partnerships to really make this program successful. Great. All right. I really you. want to congratulate Human Services on their work on this grant. Yes, Commissioner Long. Well, I, I, I am really, really excited about this opportunity, number one. Number two, bringing this subject up reminds me that we haven't had an update from Jewel in quite some time on our uh, litigation going forward with, with the whole opi opioid um, issues that we've had in our county. And that have surfaced throughout the country. Do you have anything to add to that, Jewel? What I can tell you, and, and many of you know- it Seems like it's been a long time for anything. I think that many of you um, who have asked for input on this are aware that Christy Pemberton, who's um, the head of my litigation section, has been monitoring this case uh, and really keeping an eye on what's going on. There have been some discussions out there, I'm sure that many of you have read, uh, that m more than one of some of the larger um, corporate entities that have been sued in the litigation across the country have now entered bankruptcy proceedings. And that is sort of moving the ball, I guess I would say, as far as negotiations go. Um, we have been working with Barry staff, uh, my staff and Barry staff in conjunction to move forward as part of this negotiation class uh, that was presented to us by our attorneys. I can tell you that much, I don't know that anything has really transpired um, just yet as far as that negotiation, but that's really the latest step is getting together with staff to get ourselves into a position um, to provide further uh, information and, and data to our outside counsel attorneys that are representing us in this litigation. Uh -huh. All right. That's uh -huh. all I have, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Um, item 39, appointments to the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. Um, is this the one? Yeah, actually on this one, you it, it says four appointments, but there is actually five um, um, appointments that are vacant and you have five that have applied. So you can, you can either make Thank the original you. one or, um, or appoint all five. Right. So I will entertain a motion if you want to, um, where is it? We can do the category separately or we can do them all at once since we have 
as many openings as we have candidates. Let's yes, Mr. Justice. Madam Chair, I move we appoint the applicants as listed on the application roster, all five. Okay, thank you. Second. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you to those people that have volunteered for this board. Um, do we have any comments? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 39, the appointments to the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Madam Chair, nobody wishes to comment on this item. Okay. Well, in that case, all in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries six, zero. Item 40, Greater Seminole Area Recreation District. So Madam Chair, this is a, another item where we have two vacancies on the board and um, two individuals that have been um, recognized by the um, department. Okay. Great. So I will entertain a motion for a question real quick. Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Um, it looks like we have, maybe I'm reading the wrong thing here, but it looks like there's four that expire right now. Um, am, I, am I reading that wrong? Is it like four of them that expire on October 2020? Two are from the city. Yeah, two of them. Oh, us. okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Move approval, Madam Chair, of the other two, Doc Harold Kinsey and Stephen Kuplicki. Second. 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 Okay. And these are both real. Okay. Uh, Brian, do we have any comment about that? Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda M40, the appointments to the Greater Seminole Area Special Recreation District. Uh, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Madam Chair, there are no comments on this item. Okay, thank you. In that case, all in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Motion carries 6-0. Item four, uh, 41, Pinellas County Educational Facilities Authority. So again, the recommended action on this is approving two appointments to the Pinellas County Educational Facilities Authority Board for a five-year term. Um, there are uh, two appointments and two names. Great. We love when that happens. Move approval. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Eggers and Commissioner Seal. Um, do we have any comments, Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 41, please hit star nine on the on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And we have no comments on this item. Okay. In that case, all in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Motion carries 6-0. Item 42, TDC. So agenda item number 42 is appointments to the Tourist Development Council. There will be a total of seven appointments today. Um, if you look, there is a ballot that was attached as part of the Legistar file. Uh, it does show all of the different columns and categories for appointments. Um, this one's gonna be a little bit more unique today. I will be requesting just from a record keeping perspective four separate votes on this. So I'm hoping that we can vote by column. Um, so if you review the ballots that are a part of the attachment, we can take a vote on column one, column two, column three, and then the uh, delegated um, or the 2016 policy to directive appointments for the two municipal officials. Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could we just, since we have four openings and four candidates, could we just approve columns one and two since there's only four applicants for four openings? If you would I'm like to, you can go, go for that, yes. I would so move. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. We have a motion from Commissioner Justice, second from Commissioner Eggers, I believe. Uh, do we have any comments, Brian? Thank you, Madam um, Chair. At this time, if there any, I'm sorry, go ahead. On any of the, these in this item. If there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item number 42, appointments to the Tourist Development Council, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. 
And Matt, I'm sure we do have one hand that just went up. Um, this is Mr. Tyler Payne. Uh, Tyler, if you can go ahead and unmute and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. This is um, Commissioner Tyler Payne at 11260 8th Street East in Treasure Island. Um, not sure if you're going to do public comment for the big C item as well, but I figured I would just jump on while, while you're taking public comment. Um, it's wonderful to see you all today. And like I said, I won't take up much of your time, but I just wanted to call in and express my interest in serving on the TDC and ask for your support this evening. I served on the Treasure Island Commission for almost three years, and I would love to represent our beach cities on our county's tourism arm. I believe my experience working for my family business, my legal background, and my fresh perspective as a young professional will be a very valuable asset on the TDC. So thank you all for your time. I'd love to have your support today. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, and this is for columns one and two. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, motion carries uh, six zero. Okay, column three, uh, how do you want us to handle that kit? So for column three, um, we have uh, three candidates um, and it's for one appointment um, for an elected municipal official on the TDC. Uh, the candidates are Michael Hackerson, Tyler Payne and Melinda Pletcher. I would uh, recommend that I roll call all of the commissioners and have the commissioners verbally state who they're supporting. Okay. Great. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Tyler Payne. Commissioner Justice. Michael Hackerson. Commissioner Long. Melinda Pletcher. Commissioner Welch. Despite the fact that he's a St. Pete Green Devil and a UF Gator, I'm <laughs> go with Tyler Payne. <laughs> Commissioner Seal. <laughs> Commissioner Seal, you just you just muted yourself, Commissioner Seal. Melinda Pletcher. I'm sorry. Okay. And Commissioner I Gerard. Oh. Uh, Melinda Pletcher. Okay, and I do not have a majority of the individuals who are the commissioners for this. I have three um, for Melinda Pletcher, two for Tyler Plain, and one for Michael Hackerson. I believe, um, if I can confirm with the county attorney's office, that I need at least four votes to do a simple majority today. What um, I'm going to do is ask and see if we can get Michael Zoss to who's Teams who's sending me a message saying yes, so I assume that means we need to get a majority on this. So I can poll ag again if you'd like. Yeah, that would be good. Just the two then, Tyler Payne and Melinda Pletcher. Sure. Okay. I will poll. All right, so Commissioner Eggers. Where do you go? He just hit the wrong button. He'll be back in a second. There he is. Yeah, you're right. I did hit the wrong button. And you all went away. Kyler <laughs> Payne. Commissioner Justice. Melinda Pletcher. Commissioner Long. Melinda Pletcher. Commissioner Seal. Melinda Pletcher. Commissioner Welch. Tyler Payne. And Commissioner Gerard. Melinda Pletcher. All right, and I have four votes for Melinda Pletcher for this appointment. All right. Okay. And then, then we need one more for the city representatives. We just need a confirmation for the 2016 policy directive. Um, the following two individuals um, are automatically appointed and we just need confirmation of that. It's Frank Hibbard and Rick Kreisman. Move confirmation. Second. Okay. And all in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Motion carries 6-0.
Madam Chair. Yes, yes, sir. Just out of curiosity, that was a different language than I'd heard used for those two appointments than in years past. And so not for tonight, but maybe Michael or, or Jewel can get us clarification because I was under the understanding it was not a confirmation. It was our appointment. We would take the city's recommendation, but it was the, in the end, of, at the end of the day, it was the commission appointment, not a confirmation of their appointment. It was our appointment. So I know it's semantics, but um, sometimes you do things and 20 years later, people think, well, that's the way we've always done it as opposed to actually what's written in statute. So if I could just get clarification on that down the road, that would be helpful. Yes, okay. I, I believe I did probably misspeak on that. So I apologize, Commissioner. No, no, just I, I just want to make sure that uh, I'm on the same page. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what we do if we don't agree with it because they are mentioned in the ordinance, right? No, the, it's a representative <laughs> from that city. Well, that's what I mean. It's still our appointment. Uh, so it could be anybody from the city. Oh. That's my understanding. I'm not an attorney. Those two, those two <laughs> but cities. But I play one on TV. <laughs> the, those two cities, St. Pete and Clearwater, the cities do get an elected official there because St. Pete is your largest city and Clearwater is your largest collection of tourist development tax. I see Michael there now, who's turned his video off. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Th these are your appointments. Um, you have for a long, long time um, taken the, the elected officials that are recommended to you by those cities. It's really not wholly different from the vote that you just took where you do take a recommendation from the BC, from the big C um, to that other um, C. And Michael, maybe you can give some more history. I feel like we used to maybe only get one recommendation from the big C and now we get more, but Michael can fill in the, the blanks here. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, good to see everyone. Um, Commissioner Justice, as a matter of fact, I think you were chair at the time that we put in those directives back in 16 as to those two entities, the big C and the mayor's council. At the time, my recollection is that the discussion was not to do a similar process for either St. Pete or Clearwater under the statute, the city that pays the most in bed tax and the city that's most populous. You typically have deferred to just the mayor, uh, but you're right, Commissioner uh, Justice, you could as, as a body decide that no, you want them to also nominate. It could be an elected official either a council person or the mayors. Uh, but right now, as you said it last time, it was you were gonna go with those two entities, the mayors uh, being appointed and confirmation appointment semantics, but yes. But yes, you would still have the discretion if you wanted to change that policy now. And, and I know, Madam Chair, I know I'm, I'm being a little uh, particularly about it, but we had seen in previous years that sometimes we had just taken the big C and the mayor's council appointments as kind of they had the authority and and um, while we always respected that partnership they didn't always follow the exact statutory guidelines and so we we had to do some changes back a few years ago so anyway again I just like to be clear okay I think we're clear yes Commissioner Eggers should I restate the motion to um, move approval of uh, the appointments of those two individuals sure do I have a second? I don't hear second. anything. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's vote on that again then. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. Item carries 6-0 to appoint those two people. All right. Do we have any um, new business items from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, real quickly, I just two two brief comments. Um, I took some family uh, this weekend and and toured the, uh, the Weedon Island and went over to the um, the observation deck. It was it was wonderful. And then we went over to Booker Creek. Although the center was closed, uh, we got a chance to get out and and see it. So, two of our uh, really beautiful parks in the in the county. And uh, just uh, just wanted to to give a shout out to those those two parks and encourage people to visit those anytime. And the second thing, and I just, again, I wanted to say, um, I truly uh, really enjoy and like that there's so much involvement uh, uh, from, our, from, our, from our residents, especially as it related, I'm speaking specifically of the Douglas Hackworth property. Uh, there has been just an enormous um, outcry of support 
uh, very organized and, and very positive. And um, there's a lot of great comments today. And just really wanted to say thank you for that. Um, and I, you know, again, I, I know we haven't had the discussion yet, but I would certainly think as we go forward that we would consider continuing to take some virtual input from our residents, even when we go to a, a, an in-person meeting. I just think it allows for maybe a little bit sometimes, um, uh, some not today, but sometimes controversial input, but I think it also gets more input. And I think, I hope that we will continue to look at that as, a, as an opportunity to get more input from our residents. I think it's, it's worked out really well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Law. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll be brief. I just wanted to give a report to all of you that about two and a half, maybe three months ago, time has just been uh, crazy for the last couple of months. I was invited to go down and visit John's past. And when I got there, there were quite a few more folks than I had anticipated that would be there, including uh, the mayor and the city manager from Madeira Beach. Um, it was really interesting what I saw, considering how many times I'd been to John's Pass and um, became aware that a large section of the boardwalk was purchased six to nine months ago. And at the time they had uh, the dinner cruise ship docking there. Well, within those six to nine months, the, the dinner ship can no longer dock there. And guess what? there's a beach that has formed there. So um, I heard from the various people that were there and it quickly became apparent to me that the city was working on one agenda. I came back and had a conversation with Barry and between the city, the congressional folks, the county, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Department of Transportation and the Coast Guard, that canal that goes under the bridge there out into the Gulf of Mexico has those seven jurisdictions in some manner, shape or form within that canal. And they were all talk talking in silos as so often happens. So about three weeks, maybe a month ago, we had a meeting on the fourth floor with Barry and with Kelly Levy and with the principals that I had met with, along with um, Stephen Car Carey from the Congressman Young, uh, Chris's office. And we talked through the issues. Well, I can tell you that from that time, which was no more than what, two and a half weeks ago, Barry, till this past weekend, that whole beach area that had formed has more than tripled. Now, the reason I'm bringing this to you today, and I sent to you the link that had been taken on Sunday afternoon, late afternoon by Captain Hubbard, is because you can see where he's standing at the edge of the beach area and you look behind him. Uh, Captain Hubbard is 6'7". That's how much sand has accumulated behind him between where the end of that beach area is and under the boardwalk. Now, my two concerns are, you know how long it takes to get anything done when you're working with all those different jurisdictions. The city has the responsibility for the street drainage that's underneath that boardwalk. There was about four feet of sand over those drains. And so given the heavy rain that just we just had today that totally knocked out the internet here at my home, I can't even imagine what's going on on the streets down there at John's Pass. So that's one thing. The second thing I am acutely aware of because when we were all talking about um, the changes that were gonna go on down at Shell Island, a few months ago, and I had had the um, ability to take the Sheriff's Marine Patrol down there. Uh, I heard the story about the couple of instances where young children got caught in that canal walking, you know, walking off the edge of that beach and then getting swept away in the current. If any of you have been 
frequent voters to the and I have a current lift. I'm very worried, especially given the comments that have been made by the fire chief down there, that this is a horrific accident just waiting to happen. You know, we have a lot of tourists that go to John's Pass. We have an nourishing uh, economy in this community. And for a variety of reasons, I don't know what the fix is, but surely there's got to be a short and a long range solution because obviously we can't, we have to take into consideration mother nature and the swiftness of that current and the fact that there are tourists that are gonna be coming there and little kids and people, they don't know about the area. It looks like it's one of our beaches. That's how, if you haven't been down there and looked at it, you really need to do your due diligence. It's terribly, terribly dangerous. And not only do I worry about the liability, I worry about the livelihoods of all those people that have businesses on John's Pass, especially the boardwalk. So I wanted to bring that up and give you the background and tell you all of the behind the scenes that's been going on. I know Barry sent us some information last Friday and we do have on November 6th, another meeting scheduled with all the different folks that have participated in the first one. Um, but I just do think that at some level, we have to be cognizant of the fact that this is a very serious situation that day by day is exacerbated by the shifting sands. So I could wax on, but I won't but I think you get the seriousness of what I'm trying to share with you. There have been young children that have thankfully been rescued from that have been being swept out into the Gulf in that canal. So it's only a matter of time before we have a really horrific accident. Okay, thank you, I'm done. Hopefully we can have a discussion and Barry can say something a little positive. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I do have a question. Is there any way to close off that area that has become a beach so that people are, that is a very, that's always been a dangerous pass. The current goes through there Correct. so fast and always has. But at uh, the rate it's going, Commissioner, I'm really- I understand that. That's why I'm asking if there any way to another keep couple people. Of, Certainly. But we won't be able to, they won't, we won't be able to navigate the canal is my other concern. I understand that. If it's the first question is safety, is there a way to keep people away from that yeah, area? So if, the if they wanted to, if the city wanted to erect barriers or anything, they could do anything short term like that uh, to be able to uh, block access. Um, obviously it's within Sir city of Madeira Beach. They would need to determine what is appropriate for that area. Um, you know, even after uh, Captain Hubbard, um, you know, spoke to you today, he was, you know, commenting back and forth with me, you know, certainly there's some short term issues. The real issue, they actually dredged the area a while back. This goes back many years. Um, I've got, you know, emails back and forth between Kelly kind of advising the city and providing technical assistance. I met when I first come here with the previous city manager and their public works director, and they were trying to determine, you know, what, what they should do. Um, and, you know, that th those are some of the things. The long term plan really, you know, and, and Captain Hubbard, Hubbard talked to about it, about extending jetties and things like that. Well, those would have to be incorporated with the inlet management plan. That is not something we approve. That is something um, that we have to work through the core um, and uh, federal agencies uh, and Department of Environmental Protection on because it could starve southern beaches, um, you know, of sand. And so uh, we can start the, and we can begin the study that does that. We uh, had mentioned that at our last meeting, you know, but it has to be any of those. Uh, uh, options have to be incorporated within the inlet management plan. They do. And so then that is not our requirement. Uh, that is a requirement for them. We are the local sponsor for the inlet management plan. And being that local sponsor, we're a coordinating effort. Um, and, and But the issues of the sand are, are on the side. So we, we can coordinate that. We can begin that study. Any of the short-term solutions 
you know, I think that they, between the property owner and, and the city, they're going to have to look at and take immediate action because those long-term modifications to the management plan is not something that occurs overnight. Um, so we will, we have that meeting coming up. I'm going to, I'm going to call Captain Hubbard um, this week, you know, and continue to talk to him. I have been communicating with the city manager um, and we'll continue to do so. Mm. Who threw us under the bus today in an email saying yeah, I, that it was a county problem. And, and it's unfortunate. Okay. I'll, I'll just be, you know, we're honest. I, I don't do that. I try not to do that, but you know, um, unfortunately when we have a channel, it's clearly marked. I can show you a map that shows uh, the areas of responsibility for that channel, which is the delegated responsibility that we coordinate locally. Um, that's very, very clear. Um, and, and certainly, you know, from it, looking at any of the permitted structures that require core or federal agencies or state agencies, uh, that that has to be submitted through us. So they're not dealing, so they're only dealing with one entity in the county. Um, but again, you know, this, I, I've actually heard, there's a lot of positive things that I've also heard, you know, an email from Captain Hubbard saying, you know, that they would, that the property owner, you know, could do certain things. Um, they got on block city drains. Um, you know, these, this has been building up for some time. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like there's been any action. Um, but we will continue to, Kelly has a long file on this. Um, we've been out there, I was out there with Raheem. Um, we will certainly help them any way we can to try to move this forward to a solution. Okay, uh, Commissioner Welch. Hey, Madam Chair, I'm on a different subject. I don't know if you're, we're done with this one. I think we are. Okay, so uh, just four uh, positive notes I wanted to uh, talk about. Number one, last uh, Wednesday, the Clearwater Council unanimously um, supported a resolution declaring a uh, condition of blight in the Greenwood CRA area. So it's moving that process on and they'll be coming to us for a delegation uh, of authority. I wanna congratulate the uh, Clearwater Urban Leadership Coalition for the work they've done on that. Uh, second, uh, we are the champions of Tampa Bay, and it's yes, not, we are. not what you think I'm talking about. <laughs> we have the best response rate on the census of any Bay Area County. 67% uh, self-response rate. We were trailing Pasco for a long time, but we edged them out. And we're second only to Duval County statewide among large counties. So I wanted to thank the uh, Complete Count Committee, all of our partners, our staff. Uh, Josh and Corey did a great job uh, with us. And the response rate is uh, about 2.2% higher than it was in 2010. And then we'll add to that the response rate from the census takers going out. So hopefully we'll, we'll top our overall rate as well. Uh, third thing is I'm hosting a Zoom town hall tomorrow night with Barbara St. Clair from Creative Pinellas. We're gonna be talking about our Pinellas Cares Arts Grants uh, that we're providing to help artists um, who've been affected by COVID. So that'll be on our social media. And finally, as Commissioner Seal knows, uh, early voting is underway at uh, 25 drop-off locations, including Tropicana Field, which is the home of the American League champs and go Rays. <laughs> so I finally did get to it. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. uh, Commissioner Eggers, did you have something before that I... Yeah, just real quickly. No, I just, I, yeah. I was, I had gotten a couple of calls and run into a few people, Barry. Um, and I should have brought it up under the state of emergency thing. Um, there's still out there some confusion between what the governor has done in his order versus what we have in our ordinance. Do we have both of those things available on our website? Sure. The ordinances are available. Um, they, okay. The governor's order simply said that you can go to full capacity. So it allowed uh, uh, businesses to go to full capacity. And, and in fact, it left in place the ability of local governments to even restrict capacity, but no less than 50%. Um, however, we do not have any capacity limitations. Um, the, the only two requirements that we have is for, um, to, for you to wear a mask um, and that you're, you have to be seated to be served. Um, but, it, but again, it, it didn't conflict with our local ordinances at all. Well, again, if we could put our ordinance in there, because in that ordinance, there's a few other things that, you know, like tables must be six feet. You must be the right. tables. You must be six feet apart and that kind of thing. So if we could just get put both of those things on there, just so people, I mean, I'm just getting so much conflicting. Uh, we, have understand. 
That would be great. Thank yeah. you. We do have it. And, and I know it's confusing. Um, um, and, and, you know, and, and we've also taken a very practical approach to it, though, because, you know, there's areas even when we had capacity issues where if people were really trying, I mean, they were trying. And so, you know, again, we hadn't cited anyone uh, for any of those types of issues. No, I understand. There are just some people that are, uh, uh, you know, just wanting clarification for their own operations. Uh, either way, they want to go with it, but they just wanted clarification. So mm -hmm. that would be helpful. Thank you. And um, thank you, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, for Com Commissioner Welch, for 20, 20 years of your service for public service. Yep. That My pleasure. Okay. He's back until November 12th. I understand. This is not How his last meet? meeting. 16th, actually. <laughs> he will be okay. at that meeting. All right. I'm, I'm here till the 16th. Okay, good. All okay. right. <laughs> All right, we will see you in uh, 54 minutes. All righty.